Hello and welcome back to Beyond Boards, a podcast dedicated to the actions and interests of skaters beyond skateboarding. My guest today does not need much of an introduction. Greg Hunt is simply one of the very best skateboarding filmmakers of all times. He grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where he started skating in the mid 80s. He moved to San Francisco in 1991 and was pro for stereo skateboards for a few years before quitting to pursue a career in filmmaking. He worked alongside John Holland on a few Transworld videos and then went on to make three of the most iconic skate videos of the last 20 years, the DC video in 2003, Minefield for Alien Workshop in 2009, and Propeller for Vance Shoes in 2015. In recent times, Greg has kept making amazing semi-full-length videos for Vans, music videos for Cat Power, a few commercials here and there, and has put out four photography books of his personal photos, another passion of his that he kept exploring throughout his life and career. So here's my conversation with Greg Hunt. I hope you'll enjoy it. So yeah, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, really glad to uh, get to talk to you, especially after like meeting you briefly in Paris not long ago when you were out here uh, promoting your, your latest book, which we'll talk mm -hmm. about. I usually start these interviews with the same basic question with everybody and just about, you know, how my guests started skating. I know that you grew up in Michigan and that you started skating like around 12 years old, around that age. Yeah. Can you maybe tell me a little bit about, you know, finding skateboarding in your first few years of skating? Yeah. Uh, let's see. So I started skateboarding, I think, in a similar fashion to a lot of people back then did is I got sort of like a generic kind of Kmart board, a Volterra Meltdown as a birthday gift. This was sort of like 19, this is probably 1985, 1986, when skateboarding was sort of booming again. I was just talking about this with someone the other day that actually the first time I ever saw skateboarding was uh, Back to the Future. <laughs> right, yes. And I think that movie actually isn't credited enough for how much it promoted skateboarding at the time. I think a lot of people first saw skateboarding in that movie. Yeah. And uh, my stepmom, I think, knew that, I can't remember, but she knew that I liked that or something. She gave me a skateboard. But, you know, I didn't know anything about skateboarding. Like, it was just a skateboard. I'd never seen a skate magazine or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I think that next year in school, I sort of connected with some of the skaters. Skateboarding was so small then. There was only like two or three skaters in the school and they were like total outcasts. I think I was <laughs> in eighth grade, seventh or eighth grade. And uh, I just really connected with them and they became my good friends. And that's what started me skateboarding, you know, and they that that's who introduced me to like, you know, I went to a skate shop and got my first issue of Thrasher. I remember going over to a buddy's house and the first skate video I ever saw was uh, Animal Chin. I'll never forget right. that. I, I, I didn't know any of that existed, you know, mm -hmm. like I sort yeah. of started skateboarding because I thought it was cool and learned how to ride and kind of do Tic Tacs and stuff. But then I was sort of quickly introduced to what skateboarding really was at the time. And it kind of blew my mind. So I was instantly hooked. It sort of just changed my whole life. And so I read or I heard in some interviews that you gave that um, you went on a road trip with um, Sean Sheffy to San Francisco. That's a bit later. That's in, I believe, in 1990. Yeah. And you met up with a bunch of like uh, most of the deluxe people like Jim Thibault, Tommy Guerrero, yeah. Julian Stranger and some other people. And I was wondering, like, how did you end up uh, in a car with Sean Sheffy? Like, how did this <laughs> connection happen? Uh, that's just one of those real serendipitous, life-changing things that happens, you know, it happens to all of us. But that was sort of my big life-changing event at that time. Basically, in a nutshell, Sheffy was having a kid with a girl in Michigan. Mm -hmm. So he was living in Michigan. So, you know, this is when I was 16. And this is when Sheffy was on Santa Monica Airlines. So pre-life. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. But this is after like the Speed Wheels video came out. He'd had some kind of like photos in the magazines from Shut. And he was already sort of like this kind of, you know, very uh, almost like Sasquatch type figure where there wasn't a lot of footage or photos of him, but he was just so unique and amazing and intriguing. Mm -hmm. So the fact that like Chef, he lived in Michigan was just insane. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> We were at like a, not even a demo, it was like a contest or something at a skate shop, I believe, maybe in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which was a couple hours from where I lived in Ann Arbor. And 
Sheffy was there and it was insane to see Sheffy there. And then my friend, this guy Goose, who's a bit older than me, but was kind of my buddy. I was sort of his sidekick and Goose was pretty outgoing and knew everyone and he was a total character. He basically met Sheffy at this demo and came back and talked to me and was like, hey, yeah, we're going to drive. We're, we're going to California with Sheffy. And I was just like, really? <laughs> How? And he's like, we're going to drive there in your car. <laughs> like I, had just, <laughs> I had just bought a car like three weeks before that or something. Okay. I was wow. 16, you know, like I didn't even know if my parents were even going to be down for that. I didn't think they would. But he kind of goose made it happen and my parents somehow were down to do it. So that's how we did it. I guess Sheffy just was down to drive across country. He didn't want to fly. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like whatever, two or three weeks later, we were in a car with Sheffy and we drove out west, the three of us. And so meeting with all the deluxe people, was that through Sheffy again? Like once you arrived in NSF? I mean, Deluxe didn't even exist at the time. Okay, you know? not yet. So yeah. that was when Jim still was pro for Santa Monica Airlines. Tommy still rode for Powell. And yeah, we stayed with, we got to SF at like seven or eight in the morning. And, you know, because Sheffy rode for S Santa Monica Airlines, Jim rode for Santa Monica Airlines, we stayed with Jim. You know, Sheffy mm -hmm. was friends with Jim. And Jim was just had moved, so he was living across the street at a new apartment with his wife or fiance at the time, I'm not sure. So he still had this empty apartment for a week or two across the street in the Lower Haight. So that's where we stayed, and uh, Nadis was actually staying there also. So that was like my first introduction to California was basically meeting Nadis. Yeah. Which at the time, <laughs> I mean, it's sort of, you, you get it, but you know, for a lot of people who weren't skating at the time, it's sort of hard to kind of compare that to anything. It's like being into basketball and next thing you know, you're staying at LeBron's house. Like that's literally, <laughs> what, it, that's literally what it was like. It was yeah. just like, and we went skating with Nottis that morning. We went to Safeway Curb, just Sheffy Goose, Nottis and I. And it was just uh, kind of hard to even explain it. It was just such a surreal yeah. thing. So yeah, Experience. that was sort of... Yeah, so we were with Nadis, and I don't really remember a lot of it in terms of how long we were there, or how the days broke down. It's sort of all a blur, but yeah, I mean, it was that crew. So it was like Nadis and Jim, Tommy, Julian came in and out. We skated with Javante, Greg Carroll. I met Greg Carroll. He had just gotten the job at Venture, being the team manager. Okay. So he put me on Venture. So that was my first sponsor. So I got sponsored. Oh, okay. Very first sponsor was Venture. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we went, we skated SF, we skated San Jose, we skated that, I don't know the name of it, that indoor ramp. There's like a vert ramp and that big spine ramp that was in a lot of those old Santa Cruz videos. Okay. Uh, we skated down there. We skated down Backside 9th. Luckily, the town I was from had a few hills, and I was really into San Francisco skating, so I skated hills a lot at mm -hmm. home. It sounds yeah. so ridiculous, but I would, like, skate hills a lot because I just loved all that SF footage, so I was able to kind of hang when we went to SF and we were skating the hills. And then we went to this Sequoia skate camp, and then I was helping Greg Carroll fix his car. It had broken down on the drive up. We had two cars, and... I lit off of fireworks. I don't know, just because I was young and stupid. And I basically <laughs> got kicked out of Sequoia Park. <laughs> okay. And um, so Nadis and I went down and stayed, or Sheffy and I went down and stayed with Nadis. And um, Nadis gave me some boards. And um, I don't know, that's sort of all I needed to just get home and know that there was like uh, the next year. I, so I still had my senior year of high school, but I knew that the next summer I was moving to San Francisco. You know, like I'd met all these yeah. people. I got sponsored. And um, that's where you wanted to be. That was, yeah. So for like that next year, I was just like, you know, I worked two jobs, saved my money, skated as much as I could. So that was a really, that trip really kind of changed everything for me because it gave me like sort of this focus and this confidence that Even though I love skateboarding so much, it just gave me this additional sort of like focus and confidence that I didn't have, you know. So that's sort of what got me to San Francisco. And I heard that you moved there the day after you turned 18, right? Yeah. Yeah, because my, my parents said I was going to have to start paying rent when I turned 18. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. So whatever. Uh, and I, I was already not planning on it. So yeah, I basically just had my birthday at home and then left the next day. Mm-hmm. So you moved out there and eventually you got on stereo. But I think before that you were getting flowed reel boards at one point, right? Yeah. I mean, I was on reel, whatever that, I mean, reel was, I was definitely like filming for that first reel video. I was on the team. I had sort of an unofficial, my first photo on the magazine was a what sport ad. What sport is what 
existed before Deluxe, mm -hmm. basically. It was called What Sport. I don't really know much how it worked, but I had like a, uh, an ad in a magazine saying that I rode for real. So I guess I rode for real. I was filming for the video. I was touring for real. So I mean, I rode for real for about a year or so. And um, I also was going to school and uh, I also had a job, you know, so... Yeah. I was busy. And um, yeah, then like I had this short stint where Jordan Richter came up to SF. This is so random. And he wanted to start a new company with Deluxe. Yes, I heard about that. Yeah. Family, right? Yeah. And it was going to be Jordan, Pepecki and myself. But that was like, they're never even, it never ever materialized. I can't remember exactly what transpired, but that sort of fell apart within like a month or two. Okay. And um, yeah, Jeff Clint called me. I remember at home. Uh, Jeff Clint was the president of Deluxe. Mm -hmm. Kind of like helped create all that back then. Called me and asked me if I wanted to ride for real or stereo. And um, I had just met Jason Lee. He had actually come up to SF and stayed at my place. Okay. Um, and I'd skated with him and I'd skated with Dune. And I was really tight with Matt Rodriguez and LeVar and Mike York, who are also on stereo. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was just like stereo was a no brainer. So that's that's sort of how I got on stereo. You just mentioned that you were going to school at some point during that whole time. What were you studying while you were at school? Uh, I didn't I didn't know. I mean, it was sort of like my parents really wanted me to try college, both my mom and my dad, who I grew up with them separately. So I wanted to try it and I actually tried it. And I was going part time and I really liked it. You know, um, mm -hmm. and it was only a couple of days a week in the morning. It didn't really conflict with skating too much. So for the first year, I really liked going to school. So I was just kind of, you know, I was 18. I was just doing it because my family really wanted me to. Right. And I didn't mind it. And skateboarding hadn't really gone anywhere yet for me. So it was just sort of like I was just doing it to do it. You know, mm -hmm. I remember once Jim Thibault asking me, like, so you go to college, right? And I said, yeah. And he was like, why? And I didn't have an answer. <laughs> you know, I didn't have an answer. But yeah. I was so young. But it's funny because I went to San Francisco State and, and Aaron Mesa went to SF State. And that's oh, okay. cool. basically, I don't know if that's how I met Aaron, but Aaron and I basically, Aaron was one of my earliest really good friends in San Francisco, like a okay, close friend. Okay, interesting. So Mesa went to State and I also met Huff at SF State. Huff oh, went there. Oh, cool. I remember seeing Huff skating in Barcadero one day and this is like, he had probably, I mean, I'm sure he just had moved there. It's the first time I'd ever seen him. I was there every day. So it's probably one of the first days you know, right when he first arrived and um, he had the, the yellow haircut, you know, he looked really yeah. unique, like, and he was really good. So I noticed him right away. And then a few days later, I saw him at, at school, like walking down the hallway. And that's like, back then skateboarding was so small that I like went up to him. I was like, Hey, I saw you, <laughs> I saw you <laughs> in Embarcadero. I skate too, or whatever. And we met. So Huff and I became friends through SF State too. So it's kind of a funny little thing just that I, I, yeah. I was going to college but actually like I developed some friendships and met some people there yeah it was good for networking but you didn't really learn much through the classes that you went to or something uh I mean I was learning I was liking that I was reading a lot I was you know it was like my first year in college you could kind of like pick whatever you want to pick so I was right. like taking classes that I thought were interesting and learning about stuff but after maybe like a year and a half or so you know I, it was starting to really conflict with skating like when I was for that first stereo video it was just bad timing I was really busy with school I didn't want to quit school you know mm -hmm. and that was that was tough I really that's when I stopped going because it uh I just wasn't out with everyone every day and I wasn't skating as well as I wanted to because I it started to become busier you know yeah. school so Uh, what age did you turn pro for Syrio? Like, uh, you must have been quite young, right? Like 20, 21, 22, maybe? Yeah, but I mean, 21, 22, then I felt old, you know? Yeah, it, at that it time. Me a, it yeah. took me a long time to turn pro. And um, why do you think that is? Well, you know, to be honest, how can I explain this? When I moved to San Francisco that first year or so, I was skating really well and I was feeling really comfortable and I was really into skateboarding. And then I'm not exactly sure why, but I sort of then went through this period of just not being very confident. You know, okay. I don't know yep. if it's from like all of a sudden being sponsored and being with all these different people. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just my personality also. I'm sure it's a mix of things, but mm -hmm. I just wasn't feeling 
comfortable about myself. I mean, I wasn't aware of that, but looking back, it's really clear that I wasn't really comfortable with myself and confident. I wasn't skating a lot, you know, like, I mean, I was skating every day, but it wasn't like all those years prior that I just like lived skateboarding. And like, I was like so excited to skate and learning new tricks all the time and constantly progressing and had that sort of like fire, you know, yep. in me. Mm -hmm. I sort of lost that fire, you know, I don't know exactly why, but I was skating okay, but I wasn't like, really I don't know I just in a lot of ways I think I just wasn't really happy I was young and it was a sort of a weird time in my life you know I was like not pro I was having you know I didn't have a lot of money it wasn't any of those things specifically but it was a lot of those things kind of mixed together where I was sort of like in a funk for a while and it took a while for me to kind of get figure it out and get comfortable again so there was like probably two years of being amateur or something which back then was a long time you know mm -hmm. like yeah. I feel like a lot of my friends turned pro right away, you know, mm -hmm. and yeah. um, it took me a couple of years and that was actually really hard. I remember like even having conversations with some of the guys at Deluxe, like kind of like, why am I not pro? You know, looking back, it's so clear to me why. And I just wasn't aware of it, you know. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I think I turned pro when I was probably 22. Do you remember how that happened? Like, uh, did uh, Jason and Dune, like, approach you and just say, uh, like, okay, we're turning you pro? Like, how, how did it happen? No, it was not nearly, <laughs> it was not that romantic at all. Okay. Jason was already, I don't want to say gone, but, I mean, he was already off doing movies and stuff. Oh, okay, already at that time. Yeah. I mean, that happened pretty early. That was, like, late 94, or early 95 that Jason sort of, like, you know took off from skating yeah, a bit, yeah. And, and jason and i were always really close and he was always sort of like my mentor you know jason was the person there more than anyone at deluxe who really would like talk to me about real shit you know like are you happy you know like about skateboarding about me going to school like he'd talk to me about all that stuff you know mm -hmm. and then so when jason was gone I was re it was really tricky because he was sort of not that I wasn't close with Chris, but Jason was sort of like my like the older person there who really like kind of looked out for me. Yeah. And right. um, so, yeah, so it wasn't nearly as storybook as that. I think Jeff Clint called me at home and was like, hey, you're going pro <laughs> I was like, pick, pick a pick a graphic, you know. <laughs> wow. So I don't know what, if there was some just sort of like just business thing, they needed a new board or I don't know what it was. Were you happy but though? Yeah. Were, you, were you stoked? Uh, like you were finally go getting pro, going pro, sorry? Yeah, I, I was, I was stoked for sure. I mean, by th that's when I was like, that was 95 and that's when I'd, I'd moved in with Gabe Morford and I, I'd gotten into photography and I was just feeling that was a really good, I don't know about you, but when I look back, I can't really remember specific memories or specific days, but I remember, I can remember everything sort of almost emotionally, if that makes sense, you know? Yeah. And I remember that that was like a really good period. I, when we lived, when I lived with Gabe in that apartment, I was like feeling really creative. I was taking photos. I was drawing a lot. I was skating a lot. I was like playing music. I was mm -hmm. just really like, it was a good period for me. So I was skating a lot and I was getting a lot of coverage at that time. So when Jeff called me and told me that, I was stoked. I definitely felt like, okay, I guess I deserve this to a degree. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Did you turn pro before the first stereo video, visual sound? No, mm -mm. I turned pro before the second one. Before Tin Can Folk. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, you know, I don't know, visual sounds sort of a, I don't really reminisce on that time, even just on that whole in my skateboarding career i mean it's weird i don't i think back on it i feel very fortunate to be have been a part of deluxe and mm -hmm. been around gabe and jim and tommy and jason and chris and mike dare you know like amazing friendships that i developed at that time matt rodriguez like really friendships that i still have mm -hmm. and there's a lot that stereo and being around those people gave me creatively in terms of shaping me who i am now it was huge I feel like if anything, that's really the gift that that period of time gave me is like helping me kind of come into my own as just a, a person, you know, a creative person. Yeah. Um, but my skateboarding at that time is not something that I'm really that proud of. And it's took me a long time to kind of like come to terms with that, especially the first stereo video visual sound. Like mm -hmm. I can't, it's hard for me even to watch that, you know, like the video itself is so amazing, but I just feel like that video part was just a fraction of what I could have done. And I knew it at the time. You know, but I try not to dwell on that stuff, you know, yeah. like I look at it like, I mean, I actually made a conscious like, you know, I remember at the, even around that time thinking like, okay, 
not necessarily that I blew it, but thinking like, okay, next, you know, from now on, like if I have an opportunity to do something, I'm going to work really hard at it. And I'm going to like do my absolute best to like just put everything into it. And that's sort of how I approach filmmaking with what I learned from skateboarding, you Mm -hmm. know? I don't want to say mistakes because I don't feel like I made mistakes in skateboarding. I feel like I could have definitely worked harder. But I think, you know, I learned a big lesson from that and just of like, hey, it's like really important that if there's something that I really love, like I want to work really hard at it. Yeah, yeah. I don't ever want to be in this kind of position again, you know, a feeling like, I don't know, it's hard to explain, but a feeling like a bit disappointed. But yeah, by this part, yeah, you know? yeah, 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 yeah. Some it's yeah, I don't know how to explain it, but. Yeah, no, but I think I understand, yeah. So, yeah, so I turned pro before that second. It all was such a short window. Like, I turned pro before the second video, and mm-hmm. then I think I quit, like, a year later. <laughs> you know, okay. I was, pro, I was only pro for, like, a year and a half or a year or something like that, so. And so, in that second video, so you had a part in there, but from what I understand, you also filmed a bit of Super 8 in it, right? And some of the footage yeah, in there? Yeah, I filmed a lot of it. And um, I filmed a lot. I filmed all that stuff from like the elevators and I filmed like the opening shot, all the time lapse in that video. I shot all the time lapse. I basically borrowed Gabe Morford's Niso Super 8 camera. Okay. And um, I'd already gotten really into photography. So Super 8 was sort of an extension of that, I guess, you know. And then I went in to work on my part. And I so I basically edited that part. But I had no intentions of being a filmmaker at all. It was totally... Yeah, I I read that somewhere, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was 100% just a fun, creative thing to do, you know? That's how it all starts, just like skateboarding. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I I felt that was my first... That video, I guess, was... I mean, I wasn't editing because it was done old school at the studio and you'd go and sit with the guy that worked there and tell them what order you wanted stuff and you'd watch it and kind of tweak it a bit, but they didn't... It was non-linear editing. Like those, all those old deluxe videos were edited from the beginning to the end. So they'd actually, they take the source tape with the footage on it, cue it up, and then they'd lay it down on the master tape, you okay. know, and then they'd go in sequence. And then if I remember correctly, then they would lay the music down and you'd watch it with the music. And then if you wanted to tweak anything, you'd tweak it. And then it would basically lay the music down over the footage. But you would, so basically, I don't remember where my part was in that video, but you know, they worked on that video and then I came in for my part, you know, like halfway through or whatever mm-hmm. and sat, did my part from beginning to end and then left and then they continued on and until the end of the video. So those videos were edited. You know, it's nonlinear. It's a lot different than it is now. So you'd have yeah. to actually, you'd have to sit with a person who would basically assemble it based on what you wanted, you know, but that's my first real experience with um, ever editing anything. And so you said you, you quit Stereo not long after. And I think you said in interviews that uh, Jason had left and Stereo was kind of going through changes. And is that why you decided to leave? And, and when you left, did you like aspire to maybe go right for another company? Or were you kind of like, I'm just not going to be a pro skater anymore? Or Yeah, I just was, you know, I didn't really aspire to ride for anyone else. I mean, I in terms of my skating, I didn't really feel like I was in a position to like get on any company that I wanted to, you know. Okay. Skateboarding was still really dead at that time. Some skaters were doing well, but for the most part, skaters, you weren't making much money, you know. So it's it's like if I would have wanted if there maybe would have been another company where I would have been really close with another group of people and knew the people within the company or something, maybe I would have done it, but I just was there wasn't a company that I wanted to ride for that I that I knew that well, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, I pretty much was just like I wanted to study cinematography and Okay. Uh, I want to take filmmaking really seriously, so Yeah, there was a lot happening at Deluxe that, you know, I totally get it looking back and I hadn't really positioned myself to be in a point where I had much influence or anything like that. So Deluxe was, you know, and stereo were changing, you know, and I just wasn't I, and I and I get why they were. But at the time I wasn't really happy with that. And there was changes with the team, you know, like they let Mike Mike Dare go and oh, yeah. a lot of things like that where I just felt like. I wasn't as connected to it. So it, to me, yeah. it just felt like, you know what, now's the time to just move on and do something else, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think okay. it happened pretty quickly, you know? Like I sort of thought about it, decided I want to do it, called Chris Pastris, and then just went on with the rest of my life. <laughs> okay. And so very quickly afterwards, you started, um, well, you were interested in filmmaking, cinematography, and that's what you have been doing ever since. 
but also another thing that you were interested in is photography and that started at that time as well as you said you were roommates with Gabe Morford and mm -hmm. uh, and he was shooting a lot and I think he actually gave you or lent you like your first camera was that how it all started this interest for photography yeah that started in uh, 95 Gabe gave me a camera and a few rolls of film and I went on this tour you know like back then It was really, I mean, I'm sure all companies, but Deluxe back then, every summer there'd be a big tour. Mm -hmm, They'd mm -hmm. literally, their, their van would leave SF, go east, go whichever way around the country and eventually come back like a month or two later. Wow. And I, I, would, I went on a few of those tours. So that was one of those tours. And uh, yeah, Gabe gave me a camera and, you know, I, I did a book with Jason Lee, actually, his publishing company. Yes, I made a book from those roles. I shot 12 roles. And I really wasn't like, um, I loved it, but I wasn't thinking like, oh, I'm going to be a photographer now. It was like, oh, awesome. I have a camera, you know? And I really had no context of like what types of photos I wanted to shoot or what types of photos I thought were cool or anything other than maybe my references from uh, skateboarding, you know? Mm -hmm. And looking back, like Tobin Yellen was a huge influence and Gabe mm -hmm. Morford was a huge influence. So there's that sort of portraiture and those types of moments I think that I wanted to capture sure but it wasn't because i wanted to like get a photo run in a magazine or anything i was just doing it because i thought photography was really cool so yeah yeah i went on that trip shot all that film and it's when i got back from that trip and got those photos developed like that's really when i got like the bug just right mm. right then and like other than skateboarding you know that's the first time i'd really ever like fallen in love with something like that i just became like obsessed with photography you know mm. and then it was when i started going to like bookstores and and looking at all the photo books and studying photography and trying different lenses and things like that. Gabe and I got a dark room. I started printing black and white. And then there was like a photo I shot on that trip of this kid playing a guitar, which Tommy Guerrero saw and asked if it could be on his cover of his album. Right, right. And yeah. uh, he actually paid me for that too, which was like so generous and cool of him. Mm -hmm. So that's also, I felt kind of like, okay, you know, maybe this is something I, if I took seriously, I could actually really do, you know? Yeah. And then, but that kind of quickly turned into cinematography for whatever reason, you know? Okay. I started shooting Super 8. And then I started wanting to shoot 16 and really started to watch movies and think like for whatever reason, it's like cinematography is really like what I wanted to do, you know? So over mm -hmm. the, that was 95. So for over the next, you know, it was over the next couple of years, I think 97 is when I quit. So those next two years is when I got really serious into photography and then filmmaking. At that time, were you considering maybe exploring photography as a professional thing no. or were you always, because I think you've always kept it, to my knowledge at least, as a passion project, like as something you love to do on the side, but uh, yeah. I don't think you've ever done any commercial work for photography. Yeah. But were you like thinking of maybe doing that when you were younger and just getting started or? I don't think so, no. I don't think I ever got to the point where I felt like I wanted to be a working photographer. Definitely not, because I never okay. got good gear or was, you know. But cinematography, for whatever reason, like just watching movies and documentaries and music videos and stuff, like right away, I was like, that's something I'd really want to do, you know. You just mentioned like films. I was wondering, like, uh, were you interested in like cinema as well, aside from skating and skate videos? Like, were you watching a lot of movies? And I assume you were. And like, what kind of yeah. movies were like you found interesting at that time, like really captivating? Yeah, you? I wasn't interested in skateboarding cinema at all. <laughs> I was totally, when I got into cinematography and then eventually kind of, you know, left skateboarding and just left stereo, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. I still skated, but when I left, you know, stopped being a pro skater, I really wanted to make like documentaries and films and music videos. Okay. I wasn't ever even remotely thinking about making skate videos. <laughs> so yeah, it was, I mean, what are some of the early influences? Um, You know, a lot of the classics, I guess, that we were all watching at the time, like Scorsese movies, Taxi Driver, King of Comedy, Raging Bull, mm -hmm. uh, Apocalypse Now, Paris, Texas, all Wim Wenders movies. What else? I don't know. You know, I feel like I was going to the video store all the time back then. But then mm -hmm. also like Anton Corbin, his music videos. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, his Depeche Mode videos. A lot of those are shot on Super 8. That was really influential. Did he do that, that uh, movie on uh, Joy Division or am I... Yeah, to... Control. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah right. he did. That's right. Okay. But his early videos, especially there's this video called Behind the Wheel, 
uh, his early Depeche Mode videos were all shot on Super 8. And um, actually Gabe Morford had that sort of collection of Anton Corbin's videos on VHS. And mm -hmm. I used to watch that all the time. And still, I think that Behind the Wheel video is one of my favorite music videos ever made. I mean, considering the fact that he made that on Super 8 now, looking back, it's so good. Mm -hmm. And uh, so influential, that video, you know. So I think that's that's the type of stuff I was really inspired by. And then there was, you know, at the time, like there was Baraka and there's a lot of those very visual documentaries that were kind of, you could see in the theater even. So those were really influential too. So yeah, I didn't really have like my eyes set on making like feature films or anything like that. It's just, I really just wanted to shoot. I loved cinematography. I mean, I loved features, but I also just loved everything else. You know, the late nineties was a pretty amazing time for like music videos. And there was a lot of really mm. incredible stuff people were doing, so. Is that when Spike Jones was doing a lot of those? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's when Spike was kind of, yeah, doing all those big, like this wax video with the guy on fire. And right, right. Yeah. All that stuff. Mm -hmm. I think I read somewhere that you were assistant, like an assistant on films. I'm not sure exactly what kind of films you first worked on. Like, were they documentary films? What kind of uh, gigs were you, were you first getting started with? Everything and anything I could do, honestly. Like, um, I think I was working part time at a job at a pizza place delivering pizza. This place, Za Pizza, that like all the skaters worked at back then. So even when I was skating, I'd work there a bit just to pick up, you know, extra hours sometimes uh, just to get extra money. And then I was working there kind of more consistently once I wasn't skating. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was just basically doing whatever I could in terms of film just to learn, you know. I worked as an assistant. I saw like a post. Actually, I bought a, I wanted to buy a Bolex. Mm -hmm. um, I borrowed a Bolex from Pete Thompson, the photographer. And um, I wanted to buy a Bolex. So I bought a Bolex from a guy who was a wildlife filmmaker who basically asked me if I knew how to load an Air ESR, which is a 16 millimeter camera, which I had never even heard of before. But I said I did. I totally mm -hmm. lied. <laughs> And he's like, okay, cool, because in like three weeks, I'm going to Alaska making this film about bears. And if you want to, you can come work as my assistant. So I worked, I did, I went to Alaska twice with him, working as a camera assistant, basically a loader. I was a film loader. Okay. And then I worked on this like horror movie. I don't even know if it ever came out, uh, but that they shot up in SF. I worked as a, just a basically a camera intern. And then they promoted me to a second assistant camera. So I was basically like, you know, handing the first assistant camera lenses or whatever that he might need. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I was on a film set for like a week and a half or something, two weeks, you know. So I worked on music videos, basically a lot of times for free, you know. Okay. I worked as an unpaid intern at a post-production house. Basically, I was like answering phones and making coffee. But I met Werner Herzog there. It's where oh, Werner wow. Herzog was editing all his films with this uh, editor named Joe Beanie. So, you know, all of these little things like helped you like make connections and progress. And, and just and like I have like looking back, you know, it's like uh, one of the music videos that I worked on. I met some filmmakers who now like they I actually don't keep in touch with them anymore, but they just produced that new the Pinocchio film, the good one that was nominated. Oh, for, okay. I think it won the Oscar. I'm not quite sure. Anyway. Just really talented, amazing people, but we were all so young, you know. Mm. And then actually, I worked on a granddaddy music video with uh, Lance Bangs. I don't know if you've heard of Lance Bangs. I don't think but, so. Um, no. That's how that's how I met Lance Bangs. He's like a music video director, filmmaker, documentary filmmaker, still really active, and especially in the music world. Mm -hmm. um, he's linked in with those jackass guys too. Does a bunch of stuff with them, but he's pretty awesome, dude. So yeah, I was basically doing everything. And anything I could, most of it was unpaid, you know? Yeah. But I was learning and I was living in San Francisco, not even really realizing yet that the film community in San Francisco was tiny and there's probably so much more going on in LA. Yeah. And I was yeah. just doing whatever I can. And then at that time I saw a Transworld video, Sixth Sense, I think, or maybe it was, maybe it was the one before that. I can't remember, but I saw the 16 millimeter in that video and I was like, wow, they're shooting a lot of 16 millimeter. And I don't even remember how it transpired. I literally think I called Transworld and got on the phone with Ty Evans. Or maybe I talked to a friend who worked for Transworld and they put me in touch with Ty. I'd never met Ty. Mm -hmm. And uh, I told Ty that I'd been shooting 16 millimeter and kind of studying cinematography. And if he wanted to send me some film, I'd be stoked to shoot some stuff for his videos. 
Okay. So like two days later, I got a FedEx box with like six rolls of 16 or something, which at the time was insane to me. So I had a Bolex and I had all this 16. So then I like started going out uh, with Pete Thompson or I think maybe Gabe Morford or whoever was shooting photos at the time. Okay. And I'd shoot 16 for Transworld. And I took it really seriously. Like I was taking notes on all my shots, like what f-stop I was shooting at, what lens I shot at, what the light was, how I exposed it, what my frame rate was. Because I really thought this was like a great opportunity to shoot a lot of film. Because back then there was no digital. I mean, there was, yeah. but digital was sort of like news cameramen, you know, or camera people. Uh, you yeah. know, like it was all about film back then. There wasn't like a digital HD yet. So you really had to learn by shooting film. So... I was really taking it seriously. I was taking notes. And, um, you know, so I can't remember. Maybe the first video I filmed, maybe the first video I filmed for was Sixth Sense. I can't remember. But then there was like Transmission 7, which I filmed a lot more for. Mm -hmm. And then there was Modus Operandi. And by the time that video came around, Ty and I were talking all the time. I shot a lot of Mark Johnson's part. I think Ty actually oh, nice. sent me a VX with a fisheye, uh, VX1000 with a fisheye. And that's the first video stuff I ever shot. Okay. And then Ty called me and was basically said, hey, I'm leaving Transworld. This is my last video. I'm going to go work for a girl. Do you want to like come work here and take over for me, work with John Holland? Mm -hmm. And um, I never had thought, considered like doing skateboarding films for work, you know? Even when I was shooting 16, I wasn't like making the videos. I wasn't shooting... I shot a little VX with Mark, but I didn't know how to do that. You know, I didn't know how to film lines. I didn't you weren't know. a skate filmer, yeah. I wasn't a skate filmer at all. I was like this weird 16 millimeter filmer, you know? I mean, I, I was stoked on what I was shooting and I know everyone that I was filming was stoked on what I was shooting, you know? Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so that's sort of how it happened and how I ended up coming down to LA. Right, and working for Transworld. Mm-hmm. How long did you work over there? It was uh, just a couple of years, right? Because then the, I think the DC video came out in 2003. So I assume it must have been just a few years that you were at Transworld. I was, I think I was at Transworld for like maybe a year and like three or four months or something. Okay. Oh, very short. You know, and back then when I came on board, all those old videos that Ty and John were making like feedback and the reason they made those each in six months. And then when I came on, for whatever reason, they decided to make it one a year. Oh, okay. You know? But okay. but there had there was one main video a year, and then there was sort of then a supplemental video. Ty and John had been making all these trick tip videos. Oh, yeah. And I was not into doing that, but it had nothing to do with me. But luckily, I never made a trick tip video. <laughs> <laughs> no disrespect to the... I know they sold shitloads of those. And yeah, for sure. Those guys put a lot into making them and stuff. But like, It's not the most creative endeavor. Yeah. yeah. The supplemental videos for me was the first one was right when I came there, we made Anthology. Right. So that mm -hmm. was like mostly John, a little bit of me just kind of learning, you know? Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, John and I made IE, but that was like within that same spring, you know, we made IE very quickly. And then we had like six or seven or maybe more months to make Sight Unseen. And then right on my way out, we just went on that tour and did that video radio tour. That was a video we made. We made really quickly. So that was, we made video, video radio, but I was already on my way. I was already had told them I was leaving and that I was going to go work for DC. So... Oh, okay. I think it was like spring of 2000 to like fall of 2001 is when I worked there. Okay. Yeah. So very short lived, but uh, yeah. I'm sure it must have been a very interesting experience because as you said, like they were putting out a lot of videos in a short amount of time. Was that hard to work with that kind of cadence and like produce so much footage and edit it and put out a video so quickly or? I didn't know any different, you know? I didn't know any different. I just figured that that's how it was. You know, okay. like uh, when I first went down there to meet, formally kind of meet Ty and John, they're working on Modus, they're editing Modus, and um, they're both living in the office, you know, like mm -hmm. sleeping down there, living in the office, basically like working for 20 hours, sleeping for four hours or a yeah. couple hours, waking back up, taking shifts. So I just thought like, fuck, you know. This is insane, but I guess yeah. this is just how it is, you know? I just didn't know. Okay. So I thought, like, okay, that's what I've got to do. So that's sort of how 
I did it. That's how I did it too. I mean, yeah. but that's also sort of how you have to do it when you have to turn a video around in that short of time. I mean, and you have to edit a video in a month. I mean, that's just, it seems yeah, like a crazy. lot of time, but it's, it's not, you know, so you have to basically live down there. So it was, it was intense, but it was rewarding. You know, it's like IE was a video, which I was sort of like, I didn't know what I was doing and I had no confidence, you know, but I got a little bit of confidence from that. And then Sight Unseen was a video that I really put a lot of myself into and coming out of that, I felt like, okay, I can do this, you know? Mm-hmm. So yeah, that sort of that period of time was really intense, but it really kind of gave me sort of a confidence of, cause you know, you just, when you're making any type of video or anything, you don't, especially when you're alone in an editing room or with someone else in an editing room, you just, all you know is what you feel in your gut. Like if something's working, like does this song work or does this little interlude that I'm making, is, are people even gonna, you know, are, is this gonna res- resonate with anyone? Is this, right, gonna be, yeah. is this gonna be as funny as I think it is? Or mm. is this gonna be as kind of cool as I think it is? And when you do it a couple of times and you kind of get the feedback, you're in, especially if you're in a premiere with an audience and you can kind of feel the energy and hear the reaction, mm-hmm. it gives, that's like the biggest lesson. Cause then you kind of learn like, okay, my intuition was right. Or or maybe my intuition was wrong. And you learn, you kind of learn how to navigate your own sort of intuition as a, as a creative person, as a filmmaker. Mm-hmm. And that's huge because that's all, when you're making stuff, that's all you have to work from, you know? Yeah. So yeah, that, that window of time really gave me that kind of confidence, I think, that I needed to go then work for DC and do that project. And so when you were doing these Transworld videos, were you guys like um, paying for the music rights or were you still kind of oh, merging yeah. it at that time? Okay. Oh, it was already... 100%. All licensed, all, yep. Okay. Which is even more incredible that like Ty and John and, and then John and I were able to make those videos with those soundtracks because all that music had to be cleared. Oh, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. I read in some interviews that you gave and I've heard this from other filmmakers that like getting rights for a song can be very long, like a month, two months. Yeah. And you're working on multiple video parts. Uh, for example, for a trans world video, it's maybe six video parts or something. Mm-hmm. So you're kind of juggling with all of this and the, the six month or a year timeline or something. So it must be quite hectic. Yeah. Yeah, it's hectic because you have so little time to put as much into someone's part as, as they deserve. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. like to really put the time into their part to like really give it the best flow. You know, it takes time. You don't just like throw it all together. You got you tinker with it. You're like, oh, this actually looks really good here. And mm-hmm. maybe like switching it up. Maybe we really need to kind of like swap this out for something better. Let's think about what else we can do. You know, I, there's a lot that goes into making editing a part and um, to rush it just sucks, you know. Mm, and yeah. so not knowing if you're going to have a song is so stressful because, you know, A, it's like, am I going to even have time to re-edit this person's part in a way that it's going to be good? And then also, is this person even going to be like as proud of it? Because it's really about them. You know, the videos are... yeah. At least in my opinion, the skate videos are, they're all about the people in the video. Like I'm sure. I'm there sort of like, I'm there to help make it as good as it can be and help it make it something that is, they can be is proud every, of everything yeah. er, they're, they're proud of and everything they hoped it would be and something that for years people can come back and see them at the airport or whatever and be like, man, that's my favorite video part. Like that's what it's all about, you know? Absolutely. So the, the fear of that falling apart is huge because it's not just like, it's not about me not doing my job well. It's about that person for years, for the rest of their life, being bummed on this project that they spent mm. all this time on in their, you know, pretty short career. Skate careers, especially at that time, weren't as long. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it's it's tough. Music licensing is really, really stressful and difficult. Mm-hmm. 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 But yeah, and so so how did you get approached by DC and like uh, what was your how did you feel when they approached you and, and offered you to come on board and film their first video? Like, I'm sure it must have been exciting, but also it's a very different project than the ones you were working with uh, uh, for Transworld. Like, uh, what was your initial reaction? Well, actually, so while I was working on Transworld, Joe Castrusi was working for Habitat Alien? and Workshop oh, yeah. and living in L.A. Mm-hmm. And Joe was actually going to make the DC video. And Joe, I think, quickly realized that it was going to be too much for him. If I have this right, or maybe him, but he asked me to make the video with him. So maybe it was, I can't remember if it was initially Joe doing the video and then he asked me to help him, or maybe even if it was initially Joe and I were going to make the DC video together. Okay. But, you know, photosynthesis had recently come out. 
Joe and I had quickly became really good friends just in LA. And for whatever reason, we're both from the Midwest and same age and whatever. We drew, and were both filming, so we got to be really good friends. Mm -hmm. So me coming on to work for DC was, a lot of it was because of Joe, you know, okay. because I really looked up to Joe. I really respected Joe. I liked being around Joe. So I was like, damn, doing a video with Joe Castrucci would be really sick. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also DC at the time was huge. So, you know, in terms of as being a filmmaker, like I'd have opportunities and resources to do stuff that I could never do at Transworld, you know? Sure. Because yeah. even by the time I did Sight and Scene, I was like, I ran a 35 camera. There's like that vert segment with Tony Hawk and everyone. Like that's all 35 millimeter, you know? Like I was already really wanting to kind of like do more, you know? like shoot on 35 and kind of take the production level up a notch okay so the idea of working at dc for me was like wow 100 percent, i would do that because i'd be able to do so much that i would never be able to do plus work with joe so that's kind of how i came on with joe and i doing it together and so did it turn out to be that way or was he would it <laughs> no, kind of leave man, shit like very quickly After a month, Joe was like, I think this is too much. His house caught on fire in L.A. or something happened. Oh, wow. no, no one, Nothing was hurt or damaged, but he had like a house fire. And I don't know if you know Joe. He's just kind of like, I think Joe realized he was taking on way too much. And I okay. think at that point in time, he's like, that's when he's like, I'm, got it. I'm going back to Ohio. You know, I can't do D.C. So that's mm. when Joe went back to Ohio and kind of put all into what became, I guess, Mosaic. Right. Right. Yeah. And he was like, dude, I'm so sorry. I remember I was sitting outside. We're at the ASR trade show and we're sitting on the curb out front. And he was like, dude, I can't do it. You got to do DC by yourself. I'm so sorry. <laughs> and I remember thinking like, fuck, I don't even know if I want to do that. That's like, you know, like doing it alone and DC. Like he was he was definitely we'd met with Ken Block, but he was my biggest. Joe was my biggest kind of connection there. Joe and Anthony Van England and Deerdeck, who I knew, but I didn't know a lot of the DC guys yet. So I was like. A little nervous. Yeah, so it didn't last long at all. But then I went down to D.C. and met with Ken Block. And, you know, to Ken's credit, he immediately was like, you'll be great. We'd be so happy to have you, you know, like. Awesome. You were making this much. Joe was making this much. How about I just pay you what I was paying what, both you guys and we just get started right away. And uh, Ken just made me feel so comfortable, you know, like for as intimidating as DC was, because their marketing was like so heavy, you know, at the time, just their mm. ads were everywhere. Their commercials were like, they just done that crazy Deer Deck commercial with all the kids chasing him, which oh, yeah. wasn't, wasn't really my taste or aesthetic. But at the same time, the production level quality of that commercial at the time, nobody in skating was really doing stuff like that. Right, right. So for the person kind of behind all of that, you know, Ken to be so generous and mellow and humble about it, you know, mm. that's sort of what sealed the deal, you know, so. And how long did it take from that meeting with Ken until the video was like premiered and, and released? Like uh, how long did it take to film and edit and everything? Was it like a couple of years or something or? I think it was a little bit less than two years. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. It, was, it was a bit longer than a Transworld video, but still not very long. Yeah. I mean... It seemed like a long time, but yeah, it was only, I'd say about, it was almost maybe, you know, I'd say that was probably the summer. Yeah, it was probably maybe like just shy of two years, you know, but I, I went right into D.C., you know, like literally like first thing I did was this Danny Way commercial where we shot at the, they had this super ramp. It was not the mega ramp, this ramp in downtown San Diego. And we shot, it, some of it ended up in the D.C. video. We shot Danny at night on this ramp. Okay. And um, it was a two night shoot where we shot on 16 and 35. We had three cameras. We had a helicopter. So that was like went straight in and, and I was stoked, you know, because it was like, I mean, we weren't doing anything extravagant, but there was no limit, you know, in terms of like what we were spending and what we were doing, you know, it was. Mm. And then shooting Danny at that time, I'd never shot anything like that. I mean, it's in it's in the DC video, but he does like a 14, 13 foot high 540, you know, I mean, and yeah. just to <laughs> be under that shooting on 35 at night was just like. And then Mike Blayback worked for DC. That was another thing, too. Oh, yeah. We were actually roommates in San Francisco. That's how oh, we met. Okay. 
right when he was starting to shoot photos, but he was still working at The Gap. I moved in with him and another friend from Michigan who, who didn't skate, really, right when I was like filming for the first stereo video, right around that okay. time, like 94. So that's when I became friends with Mike. And then eventually, obviously, Mike started working for Mad Circle and started shooting all the time. So And we we're both from Michigan. So having Mike at DC was like huge for me, too, because yeah. he was like an, he was an old friend and he was obviously central to their whole thing, you know, so. And so the DC video came out in 2003, I believe. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about Minefield, of course, but that was a bit later. That was in 2009 that it came out, mm -hmm. I think. So yeah. I was wondering, like, after the DC video, did you go straight into this project with Alien? Or did you do a, a couple other things in the meantime? Like uh, this whole transition between both videos, how did it all happen? Uh, let's see. I, we did DC video in 2003, and then we did the DC video deluxe edition oh, in right, early yeah. 2004. And that was a really fun project for me just because we made that book and stuff. And that's the first time I'd ever made a book. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I was super involved in that and had a lot of fun. And also, obviously, that Danny part in that was a big, fun project. And then 2004, I basically like started DC Films. Um, I wanted to start like an in-house production wing at DC. So I basically worked directly under Ken. Okay. And we did some commercials that I still think are pretty rad. Some commercials... We started this dcfilms.com, did like a website. I don't know. I was just oh, yeah, really yeah, yeah. into trying a lot of new, a lot of new shit. But then, you know, then they got bought by Quicksilver around that time, late 2004, early 2005. And mm -hmm. kind of similar to Stereo in a way, like no hard feelings, but things are kind of changing here. And I just wasn't feeling like I was as integral to the company and I wasn't excited about anything that was on the horizon. And at the time, I'd been kind of traveling a lot with workshop guys just randomly there's like a yep. dc workshop kind of habitat sort of because a lot of the writers whatever mm -hmm. so i you know in that time i traveled with joe castrucci a bit and obviously dill at that time was becoming i'd known him since the 90s but we we're hanging out a lot again and mm -hmm. uh, i just talked to chris carter i don't remember but he was like yeah we want to do another video if you want to come to work for a workshop and i was like 100 percent. so yeah that was like early 2005 mid 2005 i basically quit dc to work for a workshop okay you know? so that video took a bit longer than so if it came out in 2009 that means you were working on it for yeah. like over three years yeah that video took a lot longer why do you think that is like uh, were there specific events that happened that kind of prevented the video from coming out sooner or um Well, you know, for a long time, it was just the video not being ready, you know? So like, I mean, I came on in 2005 and there was not even the beginning of a video yet, you know, it was nothing. I think Kalis had a lot of footage, which turned into Kalis and Mono. And oh, right. Have, yeah. that's, that's the first thing I did for a workshop is Kalis and Mono. Yeah. And then we started in on the video, you know, it's just like with a video of that size, most of the people need to have full parts and have to be feeling really good about it and... That took a year and a half, two years till we even felt like some of the people were really close. And then it took about another year or more for the rest like of them every, to catch everyone up. caught up. I remember it was supposed to come out the fall of 2008, but then there was a decision Carter and Hill, mostly Carter and the, everyone at workshop kind of, for whatever reason, they were like, hey, we really think the video coming out in like January. Mm -hmm. February is the best in terms of like sales and then also like then like that spring people are still watching it when like kids on the east coast it warms up again mm -hmm. so that becomes like a video people are watching a lot through the spring and summer you know they all had like some reasons why they thought and then I think also just like maybe money and music and everything they're like and I remember Heath Heath was really upset about that because he had already finished filming and he was already he was already working on The American oh, the, video. Yeah, yeah. Stay gold, and, right? Yeah. So, yeah, because, like, he filmed that backside flip. That was the last trick he filmed. And that was, like, I don't remember exactly, but that was, like, early 2008. You know, spring of 2008 oh, or okay. something. So all through 2008, when we, like, went to Mexico, we did this cross-country trip. And a lot of that video was filmed in 2008. Heath was already filming for America. And the video was supposed to come out in the fall. And Heath was, you know, back then things were different. Heath was supposed to have an interview come out. I'm sure he probably had a shoe coming out. So he was really pissed. And mm. um, eventually I had to go meet him and talk to him. And I don't remember exactly how we worked it out, but we worked it out. And um, yeah, so, but I think everyone else was fine with having a little bit more time. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
And so I was just wondering like about the music because like I remember watching this video uh, in 2009, I was like 22 or something. Like a, a lot of people, I guess I discovered Animal Collective that I didn't know before. I'm a big fan of Mode Selector and Apparat and Mode Selector was the band on yeah. uh, Tyler Bledsoe's part with uh, Tom York from uh, Radiohead uh, on the vocals. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to ask you about these specific songs, like how did you pick them? Because like, I think you said in that interview you did with Chromeball uh, a long time ago with Eric Swisher, you said that you basically worked with uh, Mike uh, Hill and Chad Bowers. Mm -hmm. Separately, kind of, they were working on the titles and the visuals while you were kind of in the next room working on editing and that you would kind of sit together, all three of you, to decide what music to use for which uh, skater and everything. Like, uh, can you take me just a bit through the process of selecting the songs for this video? Yeah, sure. So, like, a lot of it was from, diff I mean, it was from definitely Chad Bowers, Mike Hill. They'd give me songs or albums, you know. We'd sort of like try them out or I'd try them out. Animal Collective, I think, was through Dill because Dill knew Noah Lennox. Okay. So basically Dill was like, and Dill and, you know, Bill was filming Jake a lot. So they were like, hey, Animal Collective are really into like giving us some music. They have a new album coming out for this video. And there's this song, My Girls, we think should definitely be for Jake. Okay. So that was Dill and Bill picking that song. And then Noah was going to make a song for Dill. And Noah made a song for Dill, but it just didn't work. Okay. And that really sucked because just because it was Noah and it just sucks when that happened. That yeah. song actually ended up being on one of Noah's albums later. But uh, it was just too It was just didn't have the right energy that Dill's part needed. So then I picked the, I think, In the Flowers. Is that which yeah, one? Yeah, I, I think that's what it's I called. I picked yeah. that for Dill. And I remember Noah was like, really? They want to use <laughs> that song? <laughs> But like, I just felt like Dill's part needed that energy because Dill didn't have a ton of footage, you know? And Dill's part needed that little push. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bowers would give me songs. Like, Chad gave me um, a bunch of stuff. Hill gave me a bunch of stuff. Like, Hill gave me that bagpipe song that's oh, yeah. in the intro, but not yeah, for yeah. the intro. He gave it to me. I think he said he wanted to maybe use that song for time code. And oh, he gave it to me to use for something. And I listened to it and I was like, dude, this should be like the opener. This is like perfect. You know, it's an epic uh, song for the opener. Yeah. Yeah. So that's sort of how it worked. Like there's the battles like Chad gave me like turned me on to battles. Oh, the Arto song, right? Yeah, yeah. And then like that song that's Arto's part. I was like, this has got to be Arto, you know, so that's sort of it was a very like organic collaborative thing. Like we all mm -hmm. sort of worked together. We'd like share music and then. I'd try music and then, yeah, they were there pretty much every day working in the sort of garage area right behind where the editing room was. And they were doing all those visuals. And then, you know, sometimes it would be like, what do you need? Or this is what we're thinking about doing for this person. And I'd be like, okay, awesome. And then they'd do it and then they'd bring it in and we'd, we'd look at it in the edit. And then also then I'd come and show them like, hey, what, you know, what about this song or mm -hmm, mm -hmm. this piece of music for this part? So it was very collaborative, you know. Mm -hmm. And I give a lot of credit to both of them, uh, especially Hill, for just being so trusting. That was like the biggest thing for me working on a workshop video was uh, just it being a workshop video. And it being, you know, Mike Hill was such a huge part of workshop and what it is and how it feels. And he was so like generous with that video and just letting it be my thing. He never vetoed anything. Yeah, never questioned your choices never. or your, your vision. Yeah, never. And um, I think like that was really huge for me, you know, is like having kind of like Mike's blessing just to be able to make that video in the way that I felt like that just felt right to me, I guess, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, and Chad too, because they both worked so hard on all the visuals and stuff, but sort of like trusting me with just kind of like completing it and assembling it and finishing it and putting everything that I put in into it and being so cool about it like i think that was you know i've never worked on a video like that that was that collaborative you know mm. and it's like it's exactly what i needed because as amazing as dc had been from a filmmaking standpoint the dc video just didn't have a lot of me in it you know i mean it did but at the same time it's like it's not a lot of the music that i would choose you know mm -hmm. creatively there's like the skits and stuff which it's what people were doing at the time. The Robin but it wasn't, thing and, yeah, it yeah. wasn't necessarily, you know, 
my personal aesthetic or feel, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I just really felt like a workshop video, that's why I worked for a workshop, is like, I really need to do something that's like personal for me. Cause like the Transl videos had been a great learning experience. DC video had been a really great learning experience, especially in terms of like just production and completing it and finishing it. And, you know, as a project, but I really felt like I needed to do something that was more personal and, and just the fact that it was able to end up that and the fact that like Hill and Chad and Carter were so like trusting with me and so appreciative of just me being able to, you know, do it the way that felt right for me is huge, you know, mm -hmm. so... And so after that video, you did the Dylan part for Gravis, right? That was pretty shortly after, like a year after maybe or something. Yeah, I went straight from workshop to working for Analog Gravis. It was just because it was so many of the same people. Workshop, obviously, if there's no video, <laughs> there's no... It was a board company, like they weren't going to be able to keep me on, keep paying me now that the video was done. Yeah. So I knew I had to find another job. So yeah, I mean, that was, you know, Analog was like Arto, Dylan, Omar, Stefan, so many of my really good friends. Javier Mendy Sabah, yeah, I Javier, think, was on yeah. there for yeah, a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Steve Forstner. Mm -hmm, Steve. So that was just sort of, and then they, they were just starting out. They had good budgets. They were able to like kind of bring me on and do video stuff. So it was originally supposed to be an analog video, um, but pretty quickly it was clear that that wasn't going to happen just because some people on the team were less focused than others. Okay. Yeah, and then at that time, like, post-Minefield, Dylan sobered up and really kind of, like, turned his whole deal around. Yeah. So, like, maybe, like, six months or so into that analog video in 2009, it became very clear that, like, Dylan's going to have a part done, like, way before everyone else. And then soon it was very clear that, hey, like Dylan's making this shoe. He's really like taking it to another level. Let's try to do something just based around Dylan. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, so it's as simple as that, really. That turned out great. I mean, it's such an iconic part. And, uh, and I think it was the first of that nature, kind of like the solo part like this. I don't think it was uh, the norm back then, right? Yeah, I'm not one to say. I'm sure there's people out there that might know more than I do. I, I, there might have been solo parts out before then. Okay. You know, it's not like the internet didn't exist. <laughs> you know? Sure, no, of course. It's like <laughs> there've been people have been online actively for a while, so I'm sure there might have been a solo part, but maybe maybe not quite like that one. I don't know, you know. Yeah. I think my thing with that Dylan part was like it should feel like a video you know yeah yeah like it shouldn't feel it like, did, a yeah. like it should feel like a film like it should have credits you know it should have like it should feel complete you know like its own thing and not just like pulling a video part out of a full-length video it should feel like its own little film so that was sort of like my uh goal yeah my goal mm -hmm. And so how long after did you kind of get on the Vance program? Because uh, like you did the propeller video, but that was in 2015. So yeah. that's a few years later. Like how early uh, before that did you start talking to them about making uh, their first full length? Um, pretty much right away. Actually, I finished Dylan's part after I'd already quit. Okay. So I was like, for a variety of reasons, I don't know, I feel like I'm coming across like this person that like, quits everything. I actually have like really good, I'm on really good terms with all these people, you know, I think that's just life how it goes. But, you know, outside of working with Dylan for Analog and Gravis, not a lot else was happening, you know, and I wasn't super excited about it. And uh, Robin Fleming, who was then working for Vans, she'd been like, she'd worked for Baker for a long time, and then she went to Vans. Okay. And she was the Vans brand manager she approached me about doing a video for Vans and we met and um, I don't know it just seemed like something really awesome again it was sort of like I think maybe that was through Anthony Van England I'm not sure how I ended up connecting with her and talking to her about a video but that was when I was sort of already kind of at the point where I was like man I don't think this analog program is going anywhere so yeah Vans just made a lot of sense and I knew again I knew a lot of the writers I really liked Robin I liked the brand obviously it's like I used to you know skate for Vans and my first skate shoes were Vans so it just felt very comfortable you had already experienced making uh, the first full length of an iconic shoe brand as well like with the DC video I guess uh, yeah that might have been interesting also for Vans to consider you as a candidate for this video project since you had done something similar with DC 
I guess so. I don't know. But I mean, yeah, so I, I basically agreed to start working. I started working for Vans. I don't even remember exactly, but I remember I was working for Vans already when I finished Dylan's thing, you know. So that was like, that transition was like really immediate, basically. Okay. And then that took another three, four years until it came out in 2015. Yeah, it took me, yeah, four years. So it sounds like it's, it's like every video I make takes a year longer, <laughs> a year longer than <laughs> yeah. the last one. The next one is going to be like six or seven. Or... <laughs> oh, God, please no. <laughs> and actually about, about making these full lengths, I was wondering, like, when you finish a project of that scale, like, let's say the Propeller one, since it's, uh, I guess, uh, the biggest production full length uh, video you've done. Like, you've done a bunch of stuff since then, of course, but I don't think you've done like an hour long full length mm. video for a brand like that since then so yeah. but like basically doing the dc video then minefield and propeller after doing one of these would you take a bit of time off like some vacation to kind of recharge your batteries before jumping into the next one or did you jump into them straight away like uh, how did you transition between projects i had never taken a break Like, you know, I went from Transworld, like editing video radio. I had already knew that I was working for DC, jumping straight into DC, and then DC straight into workshop, and then literally workshop straight into analog, straight into vans. And uh, I think Propeller really burnt me out, you know. That video, for me personally, was almost too big, you know. Yeah, it's like a huge team. How, how I talk about, you know, workshop, I was able to put a lot of myself into it. With Propeller, it was almost like I just didn't have the time. And not saying I'm not proud of that video like I am. Like, those video parts are some of the best video parts I've ever made, you know? Sure, yeah. But in terms of the whole thing, I don't know. Maybe if I would have had another six months to edit it or something, I could have, like, put a little bit more of myself in there, massaged it a bit more, loosened it up a little bit, you know? Mm -hmm. But but by the way, that, that video, just the editing that video was so brutal. And I almost had to make the parts in sections and then assemble it all at the very end versus like Minefield and Minefield, a lot of other videos, you have time to kind of like watch it through, maybe move things around. Two parts might feel too close to each other. So you put some like something in between, you know, like yeah. side and scene, the guy around the rollerblades and the black and white, like you find these little nuggets you can put in there just to kind of like make the experience feel a little bit more free and loose. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Propeller, I just wasn't able to do that, you know? So, but it's, that's my fault. I should have like planned it out better, but I mean, you know, whatever it is, what it is. I'm stoked on that video. It was a really good video for Vans. And I think yeah. like so many amazing parts in that video. And I made so many friendships through making that video, but I mean, the editing of that was so hardcore and I had a kid at that time. So when I finished that video, I was just done, you know? Yeah. I'm and I sure. think Vans was also kind of like done in terms of like wanting to do something like that again. So after okay. Propeller, I didn't do any skate stuff for like a year and a half. I went off and just worked as a, I had already signed with a production company as a director. So I went off and was doing for like a year and a half was just doing um, commercials and documentaries and stuff. Okay. You know, Ford commercials and Apple and stuff like that, which was really actually amazing to like just totally do other yeah, for types sure. of projects for a while and just to take a little bit of a break from skateboarding not just skateboarding but it's like skateboarding every single day you yeah know? yeah day after day year after year and then also being under so much pressure for so long i think i just sort of i didn't crack but i just i needed to like do something else for a while you yeah know? yeah no of course makes sense And so afterwards, like after Propeller, as you said, you were doing all this other work as a director, doing commercials and different things. But eventually you came back to Vance and did a bunch of projects with them in the following years. And mm -hmm. uh, in recent times, you did a bunch of like semi full lengths. Uh, not sure how to, how yeah. to call them, but like some, some, yeah, but uh, regardless of their length, they're amazing videos, like the All Right OK with mm -hmm. uh, Justin Henry and Gabriel Crockett and Elijah. Mm -hmm. A nice to see you one with um, Chima Ferguson yeah. and other people, of course. And recently you did, um, that one wasn't a skate video, but like the portrait for of Zion Wright for Vance as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you've, you've definitely kept a long-term relationship with uh, Vance then. Yeah. You know, it was doing all the commercial stuff was really fun, but that's also a grind. A lot of it's advertising and that's sort of a cold world, you know, and um I eventually just really missed skating, you know, whatever I made. There's a, some commercial I made that was on during the Olympic. 
It wasn't like an Olympics commercial, but it was on TV during the Olympics okay. uh, for Ford. And uh, as awesome as that sounds, it didn't mean anything to me, you know? There's like nothing like doing a skate video or something for skateboarding, whatever it is, and getting the feedback that you get from it, you know? Mm, yeah. And I think that's just because it's such a big part of my life and I am a skateboarder. And I think it's also because that's just how skateboarding is. It's just like an awesome culture. It's an awesome community, you know? For sure, yeah. So I really kind of missed a lot of my friends. I missed sort of putting so much into something and getting so much back, you know? Mm. And also just, you know, working with people on a project and seeing how much that benefits them. There's really nothing else like it, you know? I'm sure maybe making a, a feature film might be like that or something, but... In terms of like what I was doing at the time, like a lot of the commercial work and stuff, it's just as awesome as it was, it just didn't have that. Yeah, that same uh, value for you or the, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, so I kind of realized how kind of important that was to me. And at the same time, Jamie Hart at Vans, who's a brand manager, kind of reached back out and was like, we'd be stoked to have you back. You know, mm -hmm. it could be sort of however you would want to do it. So I came back actually like sort of part time or for a little while I was part time van stuff. I was working on what eventually became All Right, Okay. It was initially just an Elijah film around his shoe. Mm -hmm. And then I was doing commercial stuff too. And then I slowly ended up just doing basically just van stuff. And then like COVID came around and stuff. And then I was oh, like yeah. just fully back in vans again. Yeah. So, I, you know, I mean, it's just really good people there. And a lot of the projects, they're really open about letting me sort of kind of just build and develop those projects and put a lot of myself in it like all right okay that's still one of my favorite videos you know yeah yeah i know there's all kinds of chatter when it came out because of how elijah was skating or whatever i don't know i thought that was all really stupid but i mean i can see where people are coming from i think it was misunderstood you know yeah but aside from that i mean that video just in terms of like i don't know how to explain it how it feels even still when i watch that video how it feels for me i'm just like damn i really like this video like danny garcia scored a bunch of it you know reverend Reverend Baron. Reverend Baron, yeah. And, um, you know, I shot a lot of black and white 16, but with sound, you know, I was like really inspired by like the old 60s rock documentaries, like um, Don't Look Back, old Dylan documentary. Mm -hmm. They were like basically like a black and white 16 millimeter camera and a sound person. So that's kind of what I did with like Gilbert's opener and Elijah's opener. Mm -hmm. And I was just really stoked on that. And then obviously just Gilbert and Elijah's parts and, Ju and, and Justin's footage in there too. You know, I'm really proud of that video. I think that's like a really special video video you know and then yeah like Absolutely. the zion thing the zion thing you were saying which was actually sort of like that was based off a thing i did with lizzie which was very similar oh, yeah. which was all shot on 35 millimeter and just sort of you know just to have an idea i mean yeah it is marketing and it is advertising but sure i mean a skate video is a marketing uh, yeah <laughs> But to like pitch to Vans like, hey, you know, like Lizzie's already talked a bunch and stuff and we've seen that and, you know, she's very soft spoken. Let's just, you know, what if I just have like a 35 millimeter Steadicam shoot to some really beautiful moments of her, but then have her really close friends and family talk about her and just make it that. You know, okay. so that's really all it was. It was like a few days where I like just basically it was sort of orchestrated, but not really like I filmed her at home. I filmed her out walking her dog. I filmed her at a ramp. I filmed her on this little trip. You know, we went on a little trip. Some mm -hmm. of it I just filmed myself. Some we had a steady cam operator. And, and then we just, you know, I interviewed her mom. I interviewed Axel, her husband. Her husband, yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of her best friends. And it's just like, I don't know, it came together so cool, you know, because it's yeah, such yeah. a like pure, it is, like I'm saying, it is advertising, but it's such a like simple, genuine thing. It wasn't like, no one at Vans was like, we need to see more shoe or like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, we don't like, she doesn't sound, she doesn't sound good. Whatever people say sometimes in advertising, like this hyper, hyper focusing on these little things that don't matter. Mm. They were just like, yeah, it's great. We love it. So just to be able to make stuff like that or like, all right, okay, we did a little book, you know, like, oh yeah. So just to be able to do stuff like that and not have to have like a million cooks in the kitchen. I mean, that's much more similar to how like Minefield was, you know, like, or even DC was just to like make stuff just because you're excited to make it, you know? Yeah, and, yeah um, absolutely. Yeah, I feel pretty fortunate to have been in that spot at Vance and been able to like be in the position to make stuff like that. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Yeah, they're all amazing videos. Yeah, especially that. Yeah, that's all right. Okay. One is uh, one of my favorites as well. Yeah.
Elijah he skates to Fall in Rain. Is that the, the title of the yeah. song? Yeah, yeah. I love that song. That goes so well with the skating and everything. It's like super. I don't know. It creates a, a great feeling. I don't know. I just I just loved when the first time I saw it. I was like, wow, this is just beautiful. Basically, beautiful skating just goes so well with the music. Yeah, me too. And that was just a song that he was listening to a lot. Okay. You know? And there's even like foot, uh, whatever. I, you would never know, but there's a shot, a 35 millimeter shot of him lying on the ground in that video. And he, you can see on his phone, he's listening to that song. Oh, yeah. Okay. Interesting. You know, and then the Roy Orbison song in Dreams, that's something that he was like, dude, this is the only song I've been listening to. He was listening to it while he was trying all those last tricks, you know? Okay. Like the nose grind nolly flip and stuff. Oh, yeah. And he was like, I want this to be my song, you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, when the video came out, a lot of people were commenting that that song had been used before, you know, it was right. like in the, it was in the credits of, uh, Vase, the Isle video. Vase, yeah, the Isle, which I didn't remember. And then I think Nestor had used it, but it's funny oh, because yeah. that's actually a song that I had for Dylan's Gravis part as like, a, oh, really? as, as, yeah, that was one of the songs and it was like kind of too short. And Dylan was kind of like, eh, I don't know. But that was a song, that was one of the songs that I liked. You were contemplating? Um, yeah, so like when, when Elijah brought that, and it's funny because people talk so much about Dylan, or Elijah and Dylan, whatever. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's just funny because that's when he mentioned that song, I didn't say anything to him, but I was like, okay, yeah, like I've definitely like thought of using that song before. And um, I didn't even like check to see i might have like checked a little bit online but i definitely didn't dig as deep as i should have to see if it had been used but okay. then sometimes also when you're that close to deadline and somebody is like i mean he originally was only going to have falling rain and then he filmed like an extra minute of footage or something in the last like three weeks he filmed so much shit in like the last three or four weeks of that video and uh, he needed a second song you know mm -hmm. so we had no time and i was just like I don't know. Sometimes I'll definitely say like, oh, this has been used. Or a lot of times I'll say like, I don't think this is the best song for your part, you know? But a lot of the times if the song works and you're under the gun like that, it's like, fuck it. This is what he wants. This yeah. is his, his part, man. This guy's been like killing himself for the last year to make this thing like, so it's funny. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And while we're on the topic of Elijah's music, that second song was definitely like something that I was super down to use. And afterwards people were like pissed that it had already been used. But then it's just like, fuck, man, I don't know. It's you know happened I mean? before. It's going to happen again. It's, uh, I, I feel like if, if someone really wants to argue with me about that, it's like, you know what? I've been licensing music for skate videos for 20 something years. <laughs> 20, at that point, 20 years solid, you know? Yeah. Like, I've probably licensed, I don't know, a hundred songs for skate videos, maybe more. Yeah, yeah. And, like, I'm always, like, so careful. At times, some songs slip through and you don't know. Yeah. But yeah. usually it's like, has this been used? You know, like, but I've been licensing all that shit. And it's like, a lot of the songs now, when you watch, oh, this has been used, that's been used, this has been used. A lot of that shit's just fucking pulled off the internet. Like, it's never licensed, you know? Yeah. And I don't, you know... I totally get it. It's always best to use a song that no one's used. I think that's really important. And I actually don't like, in terms of those two songs for Elijah's part, I would say Falling Rain for sure. I prefer because I know so many people haven't heard it. Yeah. And when you see a video part, and you haven't heard that music before or you're not really familiar with it it just makes the experience that much more special exactly and you always associate that song with that part forever uh, you know? absolutely yeah and when you use a song that's like an iconic song that you've heard at the dentist office you know and in the elevator sixteen thousand times <laughs> People hear that music and, you know, music's an emotional thing. So they like associate it with other shit. So all of a sudden you're like taking people out of the experience of watching that video, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I do, I do prefer using music that hasn't been heard a lot, you know? Sure. But, yeah, but yeah. there's also situations like, like that where I'm like, you know, at a certain point it's like I want to give somebody, help give them what they want, you know? Like mm. that's important to me. They're, they're the person... It's their part, you know? It's not my part. So I don't know. I could go on and on about that. Stuff, but. <laughs> no, but I love it. Yeah. Actually, the other day I was um, looking for songs that had been in Jacob Harris projects. 
and yeah. that were also in David Lynch movies because he's, okay. from what I understand, a big David Lynch fan. And he's mm-hmm. like put some songs from his movies in some of his Atlantic Drift or in the Isle Vase um, outro that he used that the, the same song, the Roy Orbison song. Yeah, uh, that comes from Blue Velvet. I mean, that's my thing is like when I hear In Dreams, I just think of Blue Velvet, you know, I always have. So mm-hmm. that's funny if that's I didn't know that about Jacob, if that's why he used that song. That's pretty sick. I've heard this from other people. I, don't, I, ha- I haven't heard it from him, but that he's a big David Lynch fan and that uh, he's uh, purposely used some of David Lynch's uh, songs from his movies in his skate videos just as a homage of some sort of tribute. I mean, that's that's been happening for a long time. I mean, one of my favorite films ever, Paris, Texas, you know, the credits to Video Days is Paris, Texas. That's Harry Dean Stanton singing in the credits oh, of Video that's Days. Oh, right. Yes, yes. Like, how sick is that? You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. And that's just because, like, Mark was a huge fan of Paris, Texas, you know, so whatever. That's been going on for a long time. While we're talking about music, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about the music videos you made with Cat Power. Sure. Because you've done a, a bunch of music videos with her, at least three that I've that I've seen. Yeah. The Manhattan Song and a couple other ones. That I don't remember the titles of the other ones, but uh, mm-hmm. how did you initially start working with her? Uh, I started working with her. I mean, she's been my like top five, maybe top three musicians since like the early 2000s. You know? mm-hmm. So I'm like huge fan. Seen her live, listened to the album the day it comes out like for years. And uh, I was somewhere and uh, Pat O'Dell called me up and said that Sean Marshall, who's Cat Power, had reached out to him because they know each other to help to shoot a music video for her. Mm -hmm. But he was like, I don't really do that. Like, would you be down to do that? And I was like, hell yeah. So then he's who linked me up with her people to shoot a video for her, a video called Cherokee. And that was a really insane shoot out in the desert where she directed it and I shot it. Okay. And then, yeah, we did uh, Manhattan. We co-directed Manhattan soon after that. And then I went on, yeah, I did, I did, I think, nine, eight or nine videos for her total over the next 10 years, yeah. Oh, awesome, okay. Uh, I've only seen uh, three of them. Okay, I'll check out the rest for sure. Yeah, there's one I did, Horizon. I did a few for her, her album before her most recent album. But Horizon, check that one out because that one, Danny Garcia's in it, Sean Pablo's in it. Oh, yeah. That's a cool video. I saw another one where there was a uh, Nuge and uh, I think Louis Lopez also was in the crowd. Oh, yeah. Like she's like in a she's like singing in a concert place, people yeah. are dancing and stuff. And uh, or maybe I'm mistaking two different ones, but like there's one where there's Nuge. And he's like a cocktail waiter or something. Those are two different videos. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. It's around the same time though, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Those are two different videos. There's one Nuge and his wife are in it. Yeah. Where she's like singing in a cocktail lounge. Exactly. And then there's another one where she's singing on stage and it's like sort of like this dream sequence where she goes out into the crowd mm-hmm. and everyone's in that. Like Nuge is in that. You can see Tino Razo for a second. Oh, wow. Money Mark is in that video in the crowd. There's like so many. It's all her friends. She's like friends with everybody. So she's like, she's the one that wanted Nuge in there, not me. You know, I mean, obviously I'm super down for news to be in there. I love news, but that's like her. She's friends with all those people. It was her crew of friends. Okay. Mm -hmm. You said in uh, an interview, I don't remember which one, but you said something that I thought was interesting that uh, I wanted to ask you just to develop. It's you said just that in a weird way, filming a music video is a lot like doing a video part. And I was wondering, like, what did you mean by that? I don't know exactly, but it's true. I don't know what I meant by it when I said that, but uh, Mm -hmm. I mean, musicians are a lot like skaters. I think there's like, that's the reason why a lot of skaters are musicians and a lot of musicians are skaters. Like yeah, Animal Collective, like Noah Lennox is a skater, you know, like so many, Jay Maskus was a skater, you know, like so many people were skaters, mm-hmm. you know, it's like crazy how many musicians skate. And I think that's, there's a lot of similarities. So when you're working, I mean, I, I've only worked with a few other artists other than Cat Power. I've, I've done mostly music videos for her, but okay, you know, it's like personalities are the same, you know, it's like, there's a lot of similarities with just working with a musician it's not like working with an actor or like a normal person you know what i mean mm-hmm, it's like mm-hmm. it's a lot more like working with a skater they're just they have a different way of operating you know just because of that's who they are mm-hmm. and then also i think you know doing a music video it's like doing a video part it's like it's their art you know it's like it's collaborative 
they're kind of relying on you to kind of like help elevate their idea or them, you know, in the song. But it is their song, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, and it's like sure. people are watching it because it's their song. It's their music. It's them on screen. No one's really watching it because you're the person who made it. They're watching it because they want to like experience this person's music and, and see this person that they're a fan of or even see who this person is who's making this music, you know. So it's it's very similar to Escape Video in that way. I think. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah. That's why people are watching it in the first place. like some of the photography books that you've put out in recent years. As I said, when we first started this, I uh, came to see you in Paris a few weeks ago when you were presenting your latest book called Everything I'm Trying to Tell You. Mm -hmm. And you've done a couple other ones that I know of, at least in years prior, like you did the one focused on Jason Dill. I think that one is called 96 Dreams, 2000 mm -hmm. Memories. And you did that other one called Everything I'm Trying to Tell You, which was, I think, focused on this summer in 95, where you yeah, that first started. Yeah, 20th century summer. Oh, yeah. What, what did I say? You said Everything I'm Trying to Tell You. Oh, okay. Sorry. sorry. Which is the new <laughs> one. That's, that's fine. Yeah, so 20th century summer was basically your first uh, photos because uh, that's when uh, you were on a tour and you took your first pictures. But actually, yeah. not not many of those were people skating or not not even. I don't think there's many people like there's with no a skateboard skating. anywhere near. Yeah. So. No. Yeah. Can you take me through like working on these uh, recent projects that you that you put out? Sure. Yeah, the first book was, uh, yeah, it was basically, it started as an idea of just to do something with Dill for a magazine because I had so many pictures of him. And then we talked about it and we're like, shit, we should just do a book. So then I spent maybe six months building out this book and going through all my pictures and realizing that I had this really great, all this great stuff of Dill. Mm -hmm. So that turned into basically like a 17 year visual study of Dill, you know? Right, right. And that book's kind of about my friendship with Dill. And it's also about, you know, loosely, it's all pictures but it's about you know his sort of like ups and downs you know especially how he almost died right after minefield and then how he kind of came back so i basically used it was like i spent so much time with him from basically 2001 to 2013 12 13 and then in 2016 17 i hung out with him a lot too as just a way to like just document him in the present time for when that book came out you know okay So yeah, and that book was really, I didn't know what I was doing. I taught myself in design and I basically just did it totally backwards. I didn't talk to any publishers or anything. I just basically made a book at home, got everything drum scanned, just fully made it. And then found uh, Paradigms, both skaters, one's a full skater. Uh, now it's just the one person who does Paradigm, but they were a small publisher out of New York. Okay. They were super down. They didn't, you know. Dill and I kind of like from the beginning were like, you know, Dill was very generous with it being my book and he really didn't have too many critiques on it. But we were both pretty much in agreement that like this isn't going to be like a cheap paperback thing it's going to be really well made it's going to be like a beautiful coffee table book it's never going to be on sale on amazon okay. you know it should yeah. just be like we should make a certain number of them and they sell through it's not going to be a book that's made for skate shops and nothing against skate shops but we really were like this should be a book that's in like you know dashwood and arcana and like really awesome photo book stores that we like to go to you know mm -hmm. so yeah and it ended up being like a really awesome experience and the book came together and that kind of gave me the bug for making books mm -hmm. Yeah, then I made this 20th book, Century Summer. 20th Century Summer with Jason Lee. And that was, yeah, basically just 12 rolls of film. My very first photos. And that book's really about sort of like the innocence of when... For a lot of photographers, those first rolls you shoot, you just don't know what you're doing. You have no context sometimes for what makes a good photo. Mm -hmm. You're just shooting pictures because it's fun or you're bored or whatever. Or you <laughs> just because there happens to be a camera around. And a lot of times those pictures have a sort of quality to them that you can never recapture once you start thinking about your photos and taking your photos seriously, you know? Mm, so that's yeah. what that book is about, is sort of like, I took all these pictures on that trip. I was not planning on those photos getting used for anything, you know? I was yeah, purely yeah. just bored or just, I don't know, I was like 20 or something, you experimenting. know? Experimenting, yeah. And uh, yeah, I was just experimenting and, and uh, those are still some of my favorite photos I've ever taken, you know? Mm. And then once I started kind of going into those 12 roles and looking at the contact sheets, I was like, holy shit, there actually is like a book in this, you know? So around that time, I reconnected with Jason. We were hanging out a lot. He was starting his publishing company, Film Photographic. He had published a couple books. And I was like, dude, I have this book. And I kind of presented him 
some of the images and he was like, wow, let's do this. So that's, that became 20th Century Summer. Mm -hmm. And that was really a great experience just to hang out with Jason and make that book with him, you know, after not really spending that much time with him in 25 years or whatever it was to like be hanging out with him again every day was really special. Yeah, yeah, and, sure. um, yeah, and then I made a second edition of the Dill book for a Japanese publisher called Super Labo, who I'm a huge fan of. Okay. And um, the publishers from my first edition of the Dill book connected me with him, with that publisher, and he was really interested in making a, a Japanese edition of it. So it could be like a different version of the book. Okay, so there's interesting. A, so there's two, there's two of that book. The only one that's, that's the only one there's, it's almost gone. The first Dill book, 96 Dreams, is sold, it was sold out right away. 20th Century Summer's gone, but you can still get some copies of the second edition of the Dill book, which I'm really stoked on because I just really like how the cover came out. And there's just a lot of things about that book that I'm really stoked on. And then so that was, uh, yeah, the second edition of that book. I got to know Yasunori Hoki, who is the publisher at Super Labo. Mm -hmm. And then we then did a second book. That's everything I'm trying to tell you, which came out this year. Right. And that, that was initially going to be just a book of my color work. Okay. I had this idea early on that I was, after 20th Century Summer, I was going to do a book called 21st Century Color, which was like all of my color work from like 2000 until now. Okay. And I started working on that book. And then long story short, my mom was in a bike accident. She was hit by a car riding her bike last year. And I ended up going, it just totally turned my whole year upside down. I ended up going out to Arizona all the time to um, either be with her or help her manage, doing a lot of kind of managing, managing her medical care. Okay. And I was driving all the time. And um, I had a bunch of other personal stuff going on at that time as well. It's just a really intense tense period of time so I started shooting photos especially when I'd go out to see her I'd go on these sort of like I'd take a day where I just kind of go get lost and um, take photos and I was going into like all these really remote places and like abandoned houses and I don't know it's weird but it's just what I was doing as sort of therapy for what I was kind of experiencing with my mom and all these photos came out of that and the color book had been on hold. And then I sort of realized, like, I think this book is something different, you know? Hmm. So everything I'm trying to tell you, it's a mix of, like, some of my color work over the last 20 years. But it's a lot more personal, you know? It's, like, pictures of my friends and just skaters and Dylan and people are in Dill's in there. But it's also my kids. And it's also my mom. And it's also a lot of this sort of, like, other type of photography I was shooting that's not of people that I think was really representative of just my life and how I was at feeling that at time, that time. Yeah. So yeah, it's like, that's a very personal book, you know? Okay. But I'm still, I don't know. I think once you get the bug and once you start making books, it's hard to like stop. <laughs> I always want to make books, you know? Yeah. 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 Oh, please keep doing them. They're amazing. It's a total pain in the ass, you know, and it's expensive and uh, it's like meticulous, but there's just something about it, you know, that's uh, so like, I don't know, it's just, and it's so, for me, it's just the total opposite of filmmaking. Mm -hmm. So it provides a really nice balance for me, so... I wanted to ask you if that's okay, uh, maybe to just to give me a bit of a backstory on one photo that I saw in the book. Sure. I just saw this photo and I thought it looked cool. I don't know much about photos, so I was just wondering if you okay. could maybe tell me a little bit about this one. Oh, yeah. That's John Fitzgerald. Oh, okay, okay. I wasn't that's sure. Like, we, we can see a tattoo coming out of his sleeve. Yeah, that's John. John was trying a trick and um, broke his hand, basically. Okay. And that was okay, him yeah. waiting, like sitting up against a tree, essentially waiting. I think we're waiting to figure out what to do or something. I can't remember. But clearly he needed to go to the ER, the emergency room. Yeah. And I drove, I have pictures. I drove him to the ER. So I have pictures in the car and stuff. But that picture I always really love just because it almost looks like a bird or something. And there's a yeah. lot of, in that book, there's a lot of sort of like symbolic, there's a lot of uh, hand gestures in yeah, that book. Yeah. And that's sort of part of the whole, everything I'm trying to tell you. There's almost, it's almost like sign language, you know? Yeah. So that's why that photo just works really. And there's a lot of sort of, I don't know. At the time when I made that book, I was really in like a very intense up and down emotional state. And um, that book's really about like love and loss, you know? And there's a lot of really dark 
that book for me, when I look at it now, it's like, damn, this book is really dark, you know? Yeah. People yeah. might not people might not see it that way. There's a lot of like metaphorical stuff in there and symbolic stuff in there that for me is pretty dark and it's about death and, you know, how hard life can be. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's why that photo works in there also. But really it's also like there's a lot of these sort of like hand gestures and things in the book that that's also sort of a theme. So no, it looks cool and I, I like how I don't know like I was thinking that just the trees that are like behind him like the way his hand is kind of all um, disfigured or like a, like yeah. Um, yeah it kind of resembles the tree or like the root of a tree or yeah. something I don't know there's mm -hmm. like a, like you can tell his hand is broken of course but I was wondering if at the moment you shot this photo were you purposely telling him to put it like with the trees at a certain no. angle or No, I, I, I don't really ever do that. I usually try to like work around whatever someone's doing. So he was holding his hand up just because it was injured. Okay. And I mean, I, I shot maybe like four or five photos of that. And I you can kind of see how I sort of kind of couple he's in it. And then I kind of move in closer. And, you know, when you shoot photos, it's like a it's a gut feeling thing. So you're kind of like framing stuff. And you'll I, I just, you know, you'll be like, oh, that's actually really interesting. Oh, that's actually cool. And you'll kind of be moving around trying to find something. And, and so, you know, a lot of it is like for me, subconscious, you know, I don't know. Yeah. It's, or it's also like if something looks good in a frame and it has a nice balance and it looks really interesting, you know, but then, yeah, looking back on that photo for me, it's like it looks like a bird, you know. And yeah, yeah. It's just like an, it's in a tree. So I think that's one thing that makes that photo really interesting, whether you realize it or not. It almost looks like it looks like a bird and you see these trees but clearly it's someone injured so there's a lot of like weird interesting things happening in it yeah, i highly recommend whoever's listening to this to uh, pick up uh, a copy of this book because it's it's uh, pretty amazing yeah thank you so the last question for me is just basically what would you say is uh, one of the most valuable lessons that you feel you've learned from skating is there something that kind of sticks out to you as a very valuable life lesson I mean, I guess so. I, I think it would probably be just work hard and be a good person, you know, like those mm -hmm. are two things that uh, I think through skateboarding, like we talk, spoke about earlier, I learned the value of hard work, you know? Yeah. And then I think looking back over the last, you know, now 30, over 30 years that I've been in skateboarding, I think just, you know, reconnecting with people or just a lot of the friendships I've developed and I still have and just realizing how important it is just to be a good person, you know, with the people that you're skating with, the people that you're working with. I know that sounds so broad, but like I've always really tried to like be the best friend I can be or when I'm working with someone on a project, be as like true to them as possible or if it's the person I'm working for, you know, mm -hmm. just be as straight and hardworking and as honest as I can, you know? So I think those two things, like definitely through skateboarding, I learned the value of like working hard because I think I didn't do it enough for a while. And I learned real world experience, how important that is. And then I think just through having done it for so long, it's clear to me how like just being a good person and treating everyone with respect, no matter who they are, is so important because yeah. you just, you never know. I mean, in skateboarding for sure, but I'm sure in every industry and in every type of thing in the world, you just, you never know that like a kid who you meet how that person might be intertwined in your life down the road exactly you know that person might own a company down the road that sure. you yeah. you work for you collaborate with or that person might end up being one of your best friends you know, you just, you know you just don't know so i feel like i've learned just through meeting people I don't know how to explain it, but just, you know, a lot of times now I'll meet someone and, or I'll be friends with someone and they'll say, remember when we met? And I'll just realize like, man, I'm really glad that I was like back when I don't even remember what kind of person I was in the nineties that I was cool to everyone. And I wasn't like burning bridges, you know, I think yeah, yeah, yeah. skateboarding's it's like a family and it's so much smaller than people think it is. And I think like, it's so, I see so many people burn bridges and it's so hard to get out of that. If you burn people, It's yeah. just too small. It's too insular, you know, like we're all too close. So just just be cool to everyone, you know, like I think that's so important. So absolutely. Yeah, very true. Okay, so I have a few questions from a bunch of people. This very first one is not a question. It's more like a shout out from Chris Pastras from Dune. Okay. He just said that Greg is one of the most intelligent skaters I've ever had the pleasure of working with. 30 some odd years later, and now our kids are the same age. That's surreal. Okay. Yeah. It's funny. His kid, his, his kid and my kid, they're like miniature versions of each of us. You know? <laughs> oh, cool. 
So it's really funny when our kids hang out together because it actually really looks like a miniature, a miniature Chris and a miniature me. You know what I mean? It's sure. It's pretty rad. How old are your kids? Uh, six and nine. Okay. Okay. I have two kids. Yeah. So my older boy is the same age as、uh, Chris's. That's、uh, Dune's kid. Okay.、Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah. Okay. This next one is from Tobin Yelland. So he asked a couple of things. Maybe I can read you all the questions he sent, and you can maybe pick one if you want. Sure. So he said the first one is, can you tell us a story of when you and Gabe Morford lived together? The second one is, how did you piece together your bills on a skater's wage when you were skating pro? I remember something about needing to get photos taken of you so you could get photo incentive enough to cover all your bills. And the last one is, maybe could you talk about coming up and how the struggle influenced you? Hmm. Okay.、Um, a funny story about, or a good story about living with Gabe. Well, let's see. I learned a lot from living with Gabe. Gabe was, as anyone who's been lucky enough to spend a lot of time with Gabe, would know that he's like, he, I don't know, he's kind of a Renaissance man, you know. But he's also extremely humble and dedicated to his work, you know.、Mm-hmm. So I had the privilege in the '90s of living with Gabe and、uh, hanging out with him every day. I don't know whether he liked it or not. <laughs> I was always I was always in the car. So like all his a lot of his photo shoots and photo skate days, I'd be out with him.、Mm-hmm. But even more importantly, I'd go to the lab with him every day and pick up his photos. You know, back then it was all film. It was all slides.、Uh-huh. So、I remember I remember sitting in his car driving into Lux. Looking through like his slides that he had just gotten back of like Cardiel and Huff and like Gans and all these iconic pictures, you know. But Gabe, like I said, was like he was a man of like many talents, you know. I remember,、uh, okay, I remember one. It's maybe not as interesting, but I remember once it was a rainy day and coming home, and、um, Gabe had like came in the living room and there was like knots tied. On everything, like all the handles of all the drawers, table legs, doorknobs, there's like this like twine with all these different knots. And he、okay. had a book, and I guess he was like he had been an Eagle Scout when he was a kid, which here is like high level scout where you like learn how to do all these real world things. And、okay. uh, he was learning how to like on his spare time, he was basically like practicing all these different type of knots, you know. Okay, okay. But I say that because. I think Gabe doesn't get enough credit in skateboarding. Like Gabe is, I'm pretty sure who started bondoing stuff. Gabe, I'm pretty sure is who started lights and generators. Gabe is like, I don't know if this is true, but I heard. I think I, I can't remember now, but he would take locks. He'd have a because like so you cut a lock on a schoolyard fence and you put your own lock on, right? That's what people would do for a while.、Mm-hmm. But he would take locks and take them down to the San Francisco, right by the San Francisco Bay Bridge, where there's a lot. Of like, or the Golden Gate Bridge, where there's a lot of like waves crashing up and water in the air, and let him sit there for like a year and kind of rust and age a bit. So then he could then later take them to a schoolyard fence and put it on the fence, and it wouldn't look like a brand new shiny lock. It would look、uh, like an old rusty lock. So anyway,、wow. lots of Gabe <laughs> stories. And as far as getting by as a skater in the '90s, it was not easy, and it was not what one might think it was. You know? Yeah. Like I pretty much always had to work. You know, and a lot of that be- is because I wasn't maybe skating completely up to my potential, and I didn't have a good selling board, and I didn't have a shoe sponsor, whatever. You know, but、mm-hmm. a lot of skaters then had to work, and I think nowadays too, a lot of skaters、yeah. have to work. But I'm sure. Well,、yeah. I I almost always had to have a job. You know, I didn't like selling my product at FTC or wherever down at you know Pier Seven or Embarcadero. I, I didn't, I didn't, I don't know. It was just a lot of work, and I didn't like doing that. I just kind of would rather have a job at night or in the morning to earn extra money.、Mm-hmm. Um, photo incentives were like Tobin said. I don't remember ever having to like get photo incentives to pay bills, but definitely you know when you're making like five hundred bucks a month or seven hundred fifty bucks a month, that extra like eight hundred dollars in photo incentives if you had an interview. Is like really helpful for sure. So it was a it was like a hustle, you know. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. it was like a hustle. It was there was never a time. Only maybe for a short period of time was I really living off of like what I was making from skateboarding. And、mm-hmm. even then, that was like very meager. You know,、mm-hmm. most of the time I was like having to kind of figure out other ways to like work or get extra money. Do a side job, you know. That's why, like the pizza place I worked at, Zaw、oh, yeah. Pizza, there are always skaters working there. You'd see Carl Watson there, or just you know, if like money was tight, you could call him up. You could work for a week, make some extra money, and you're good. You know, it was just yeah,、tight. yeah, okay, yeah. 
Okay, this next one is from uh, Heckride. So he said, Hey Greg, can you tell us the story of why you made the Minefield VHS tape for that small event that I believe was in Michigan? Also, I know I've asked you before, but if you ever change your mind in parting ways with one of your last two tapes, I'd gladly buy it from you. And you just said it also, much love, you're the best. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that was, um, Vans had a House of Vans event in Detroit. They asked me to have a room there. It was basically in this old school where I could do whatever I wanted in this room, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of like photo show or whatever. And that was, I guess it was 2019 because it was the 10th anniversary of Minefield. So mm -hmm. I was like, oh, let's just do, since it's the 10th anniversary of Minefield, I'll have some photos on the wall. I'll do a little slideshow. And then I think there was a little bit of extra money left, you know? So we're like, what can we do? And then uh, I'd been talking to Jeremy Tubbs, who works at Quasi, and Chad Bowers, I think. I don't know. We'd been talking about VHS or something. But anyway, that's where that came from. We basically had an extra 500 bucks in the budget to do something. Okay. And we came up with the idea of just making 50 VHS, which there never was a VHS. So 50 VHS copies of Minefield off of the actual master. So I sent Jeremy the, a DV cam version of the actual master of the video. So the quality was good. Okay. And um, Chad Bowers found the original art and made the box cover. So it's like pretty legit, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then we made 50 of them. And the intention with me was just to give them away to the people who showed up, you know? Because it was okay. like January in Detroit. And it was like the coldest it had been in years. It was like three degrees outside or something like that. So I just figured like, yeah, any Anyone who shows up gets a VHS. Special so present. That, yeah. It wasn't like ever supposed to be something that was like sold or collector you know. item or yeah. yeah. So yeah, I saved. So the answer is no. I'm gonna keep, <laughs> I'm gonna keep the two copies that I have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I tend Hold to keep. To that. Yeah. I tend to keep one or two of everything just for my kids. You know. Yeah. And then uh, someday they can do whatever they want. So maybe Freddie, you can hit. You can hit hit my kids up and like. <laughs> 40 years or something when I'm gone and <laughs> ask them, yeah. Okay, this next one is from Meza, from Aaron Meza. He has something, we kind of talked, we talked about it earlier, but um, he said, how far along was the company Family Tree or Family to becoming a reality and who was going to write for it out of Deluxe? Yeah, it was, uh, how far along was it? I think it was just, we barely came up with the name. Mm -hmm. I might have had an FTC ad that had a family logo on it, which is, I remember that. And if that's true, that is so random because there was no logo. So okay. there was no anything. And it was just myself, Jordan Richter and Aaron Pepecki, which is also just so random. So... All right, next one is from Tim Anderson from Bob Shirt. He said, for the Minefield intro, did he use the Amazing Grace bagpipes music, which are traditionally played at funerals, to signal the death of the old alien workshop, implying the birth of the new alien? Or am I looking way too far into it? <laughs> also, how much input did Mike Hill give for Minefield? And thank you for all your contributions to skateboarding. Awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we talked a little bit about that earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah the song, yeah. I think that song might have been, there might have been another song in the video, maybe one of the songs in the interludes. Mike definitely gave me music, but that song was definitely like a song that Mike gave me. Okay. And I did not use it with any type of like death of the old workshop. Intention. I would have never, I would have never had the balls to even think that way because I was working direct, directly with Mike, you know, and mm -hmm. I had so much reverence for workshop, you know, and what he had made. Mm-hmm. But I just thought oh, there's just something so powerful about that version of that song, especially on the bagpipes. And, um, you know, like I said, I think he had wanted to use it for something in time code. I vaguely remember, yeah, saying that I thought it should be the intro song and him kind of being surprised by that, but being into it. Like I said, Mike was very involved, you know, like all of those Art, the animations and everything that's in between. The letters, minefield letters, yep, the yep. Uh, magnetic oil, you know. All of that is Hill and Chad, you know. Okay. So Hill had a huge part to do with that video. And then he sat with me and Chad for all of it, I think. I don't really remember, but just watching through it, you know. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Mike was really involved. I mean, he, Hands was there. On. he was there most nights, you know. Like those guys were out back doing their thing, you know. Mm -hmm. So. 
All right. Well, while we're on that,、uh, I have a question from Chad Bowers. So he said, if you had to outfit a young person today with a camera slash equipment who had no filming or editing experience, what would you choose and why? What equipment would I give them? Yeah. What kind of camera equipment? Yeah. I'd give them a still camera. I'd probably give them a film still camera. And I'm not saying that this is like the best way to do it, but that's what I would do. Okay. Because I feel like a lot of videographers, if you want to call it that, filmers, over the years, I felt like a lot of them could ben- would benefit from shooting stills. Okay. Because when you shoot stills, you really learn shutter speed, you learn aperture, you learn exposure, you learn framing, you know? Especially when you're shooting on film, you have to really. And I'm not like, I'm pro digital too, you know? Sure, yeah. But、uh, when you shoot film, you have to really pay attention to what you're doing, especially when you're learning. And then when you see the results, you're really like, oh, wow, that's kind of what 30th of a second shutter looks like, you know?、Mm-hmm. Or that's what shooting wide open looks like, or whatever. You just, and then you also get a feeling for what resonates with you, you know? And I think it helps you kind of like identify the types of imagery that you really, you know, that you really like, that you really connect with. And I think that's more important than learning how. How to use like a certain type of video camera or editing software. I think like just really familiarizing yourself with just the basic photographic principles and then through that learning what you really want to express is the most important thing. So、mm-hmm. I think I'd probably give someone like a、uh, old film SLR camera with a 50 millimeter lens or something. Okay. Because、okay. that's what I started on, you know? Start them with the basics, and then I think you can build it up from there. Because、yeah. I think, like, even if you're shooting on a, you know, an Arri or a Red or a, or a Panasonic camera, it helps to know what that shutter speed means. Yeah, you all know? the basics. And, what, and、uh, what, that yeah. Ap- what that aperture does, you know, and、exactly. all that stuff. I think it really helps. So、um, that's what I would give them. Okay. It's a good question, Chad. Okay. I have a couple questions from Eric Swisher from Chromeball. Okay. You can pick one if you want. Like you said, the first one is which is more challenging for you doing the first video for a big brand like DC and Vans or stepping into a legacy of classic videos like Alien? And second question is how much of previous Alien videos did you let inform Minefield and were you ever afraid of losing yourself in the process? And how much did Mike Hill and Chris Carter play into the making of that video? Thanks for everything over the years. Okay.、Um, We kind of covered a bit the second question.、Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think、uh, in terms of doing a、uh, new a video for a brand that maybe doesn't have like a visual legacy or something versus doing workshop,、mm-hmm. I'd say ne- neither one is easier. They're both really challenging for different reasons. You know, like doing a video for like DC is tough because you're kind of coming up, you're having to kind of develop everything out of nothing, you know, or try. I guess, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then doing a video for a brand like Workshop is really intimidating because it has, such a, a,、yeah. has such a strong history and has like these fans and people that are like, you know, could easily be bummed if it's not, if it doesn't feel authentic to what they love so much, you know? Sure. Yeah, I thought about that a lot making、uh, Minefield. It's like, you know, Photosynthesis for sure was an amazing video, but that kind of came out when I was already making videos and I was almost more of like a peer of Joe. I wasn't like a kid, you know?、Mm-hmm. Versus like Memory Screen is a video that like I would watch all the time. When I lived with Mike Dare, Stereo Days, we would watch that video, you know, kind of from a different perspective as being a young skate rat, from almost more of an artistic perspective, we appreciated it, you know? So, like, that was something I was very conscious of, and it actually took me a while. While to kind of figure out how I wanted Minefield to look and feel, you know? Because、mm. at first I didn't know, you know? Like, I didn't want it to mimic photosynthesis or memory screen. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Code, you know, I wanted it to feel like its own piece. I wanted it to feel like it's its own video and have its own identity, but also it needed to fit within Workshop's identity, you know? Yeah. So, I, I, eventually, I think it was a lot of it was just me shooting a lot and like really kind of. You know, I really, I don't know, I can't remember, but I know if it was a conscious decision, but approaching a lot of the filming, not the skate filming, but the, all the Super 8 and 16, kind of like my photography, where I really just wanted to capture people as they are, you know?、Mm-hmm. Like, I really wanted, like, all, like, Omar and Dylan and Ave and everyone in that video, Heath, 
if you see them on screen, I want it to feel like a little kind of peek into their world, you know, kind of like that's the type of photography I really love, you know, yeah. not just like a, a beautiful portrait. And but it's like really capturing a moment or like a really funny moment or a really amazing moment or like a part of that person that you haven't seen before. So that was like how I sort of approached a lot of the visuals in that video was like trying to capture these people in the most natural way or capture it's all I basically my rule was like always have a camera ready always yeah if I'm driving and literally if I was driving I'd have a super eight on my lap if I was filming video I'd have a 16 or super eight ready also and the exposure set and everything so if something funny or crazy happened I could shoot on 16 or super eight and then also, I think I just really love shooting visuals. You know, I think the types of like landscapes and structures and time lapse and shit like that. I think I just realized that I really love it was very conducive. The type of stuff I like to film was very conducive with like the workshop aesthetic. So it was sort of a mix of like me getting comfortable with like, oh, this stuff that I'm really into is really working. And then also a lot of this sort of like, I guess you could call it B-roll of a lot of the team. Mm -hmm. I was really just trying to capture these people as they are, but that really felt that was really working too. It's difficult to explain, but I guess my, the short answer is it took me some time you know, mm -hmm. to eventually like find a spot where I feel like, okay, this feels workshop, but it also feels like something different. From the previous videos. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Was that the, the two questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The second one was kind of uh, the involvement of Mike Hill and Chris Carter in the making. And uh, we, we kind of talked uh, not much about Chris Carter, but uh, yeah. well, definitely Chris, Mike I mean, Hill and Chad Bowers. I mean, you got to give, I think it's important to give Chris Carter credit because I haven't talked about him enough, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chris Carter, as much as I worked with Hill on the creative end and as how integral he was, obviously, in that video, looking and feeling the way that it did, Carter was like the backbone. I mean, mm. like, Carter is who I was on the phone with every day. Carter knew like everything about every team writer, the problems they were having, the drama between people, issues I was having, you know, like Carter was definitely my like confidant or whatever during yeah, that video. Yeah, yeah. And he really, he really had my Supported back. Supported you, like, yeah. Totally 100% supported me, totally 100% believed in the project. Like, you know, kind of like, I mean, I'm sure every, everyone's said it a million times, like for everyone on that team, Carter's like, he's like a father figure, also like a brother, you know? Looking back on that video, sort of like the time that I had with Carter and Hill and my experience of working with Carter and Hill is sort of what I take away from that whole project as being like some of the most, the most special, you know? Mm -hmm. Just because of how much those two meant to me going into it, you know? And then the relationships that we developed throughout it and coming out at the, on the other end, um, having those relationships being even stronger. Like for me, that's like really probably the best. I could have never hoped for anything more. Like that's really what I look back at the most fondly, you know, is, is those two and my, my working with those two. Mm. And Chad too, and me, meeting Chad as well. So, and everyone at Workshop was awesome. So. This one is from, uh, so this guy is called Bastien Rogest. He's from France. He's a young up and coming filmer. He's done a few full lengths uh, from his uh, town of Montpellier in the south of France. And um, awesome. I just had him on a podcast. And he said, he asked you, um, you've talked about the look of 30 frames per second versus 60 FPS yeah. and the Jenkin interview about HD camera. Yeah. He asked, what is, according to you, the best ratio between shutter speed and frame rate to use for skateboarding? Example, mm -hmm. 60 FPS at 1 to 120 yeah. or 60 at 1 to 250. I'm not sure if I'm making myself clear because... Uh... Yeah, so okay. I sort of, I don't like 60p or 30p, you know, but your eyes adjust to it and eventually you forget about it, you know? Okay. Yeah. I prefer 24p, you know, or in Europe, it's 25p, you know? Okay, okay. Like, I just think if you want to really get deep into it, I could be wrong, but I feel like 24p is very close to how our eye sees things. Okay. Um, I mean, if you just put your hand in front of your face and you wave it back and forth and say hi to yourself, your hand is not crystal clear. It's blurry. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And I think if you look at your hand moving it's kind of close to like, so 24p is, is roughly 150th or 160th of a second. It's about a 180 shutter angle. And I really do believe that that's pretty close to how we see life, you know? Okay, okay. And I think that's also what all films are shot on. Most everything's shot on 24p. Once you get into 30p or 60p, things 
start looking a little bit more like video, I guess you could mm. say. Yeah. And then when you shoot at 30p or 60p because you're at a higher frame rate, you need to shoot at a higher shutter speed. And that influences that video look even more because mm -hmm. now there's more frames per second and you have a higher shutter. So all of a sudden your hand being blurry when you put it in front of your face, it's all sharp the whole time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why once okay. you get into 60p and a high shutter, things, in my opinion, look very hyper real, you know? It just doesn't look real to me. And that's why like it's happening all over. Now you will go into like, say you're going to a skate shop or you're going to a bar or a restaurant and you look at the TV and they have their TV set to like, there's all sorts of names for it, but it's basically like more, it's like a higher frame rate mm -hmm. because for sports, people love it. But sometimes, you know, you'll see your favorite movie or show on this higher frame rate and it looks like a soap opera or a porno. It looks really <laughs> cheesy. Yeah. That's because it's at a higher frame rate. So it's like skate videos, you know, now everything's 30p or 60p, which it's a tricky thing because it's really difficult shooting skating in 24p because when you shoot a higher shutter speed at 24p, it looks like shit. It looks like Saving Private Ryan, which looked great in that <laughs> film, but it doesn't look good for skateboarding. Everything looks like it's moving too fast. Okay. So, but you can shoot skating in 24p. It's not impossible, but it's like if you're doing a full length video, you're, you're, you have to go about it differently. Like uh, hockey, Benny, Benny Maglinell has done some 24p oh, yeah. videos. Okay. And um, I still want to do a 24p video. I've been trying forever, but it's hard, you know? I mean, like that Lizzie thing and that Zion thing, those are 24p, but they're not really skate videos. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, okay. so I guess the answer to that question is when I shoot, I would say 30p or 60p for me is almost kind of the same. If I'm shooting skating, I shoot at 60p. And then what everyone does is you shoot at 1080 60p or 720 60p, but then you edit on a 30p timeline and then show you sequence. And what your editing software does is it'll basically take out every other frame. So you're only seeing it in 30p. But mm -hmm. if you want to do a slow-mo, you have those extra frames so you can do a nice clean slow-mo with those extra 30 frames that you have. So that's been the formula for a long time. Like that's the Dylan Gravis video was shot that way, you know? Okay, okay. So that's been the formula forever. I tend to shoot like 250th of a shutter at 60p. A lot of people think that's too slow, but I disagree. You can slow-mo 250th and it looks great. Sometimes if it's something that I know is gonna be a slow-mo and there's a lot of flipping or something involved, mm -hmm. I'll shoot at 500th of a second. But I don't shoot any higher than 500th of a second at 60p because when you use it at 30p, I can see it. I think the shutter speed's too high, it looks weird. Mm -hmm. A lot of people do it. A lot of people are doing this super slow-mo kind of thing right now, like you know, like Strobeck does it, which yeah, I think yeah. is awesome. That's, that's Bill's style. But um, I don't personally like shooting above 500. So to answer his question, if I'm shooting at 24p, I always shoot at 60th or 50th of a second. That's just what you have to do, unless you have a specific look that you want, but that's how you shoot it. And then um, at 60p or 30p, I shoot at 250th. If it's not skating and I'm shooting 30p, I'll shoot at 120th. That's sort of, a, or 100, that's a nat, more of a natural look. But if you have skateboarding or action, you gotta do, you gotta do 250. Mm -hmm. 120, you can get away with, but. Sorry, the, I, I'm trying to keep this as short as I can. It's like, it's opening a can of worms, but yeah, I, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I pretty much do, you know, 60p, 250, that's where I am. Okay. If it's really dark, I might do 120th, or if it's very technical, I might do 500th, but 250th is kind of my sweet spot. All right, this next one is from Thomas Campbell. Awesome. So he said, hi, Greg, I hope you and your family are great. What was the most interesting or amusing attribute or situation you can recall about your time working with or being friends with Dylan Reeder? So that's one question. The other one is, who was the biggest inspirational photographer that got you to shoot photos? And I guess the second one, you kind of, well, I don't know if it was the biggest, but like obviously Gabe Morford uh, was uh, pivotal for you and in, in your initiation to shooting. Gabe, for sure, in terms of getting me to shoot. But I would say I realized once I started shooting a lot, I realized how influential Tobin was in my photography. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like you have these things that you're exposed to as a young person and they influence you sometimes in ways that you don't even realize. Yeah. You sure. know, for example, like this is going way back, but like Santa Cruz, Wheels of Fire and Streets on Fire and also Sick Boys. Mm -hmm. Those videos were by far my favorite videos, you know, and it wasn't until I really started shooting skating a lot that I realized like, man, I think I just love shooting 16 so much because that's what those videos were shot on. I mean, Sick Boys was super eight, but it still felt like 16 mm -hmm. shot on film. 
And that's what I identify with. And I still, I think I'm always trying to capture that thing in those videos, you know, like Nottis and Wheels of Fire, or like Alling to Tail on his front porch and skating down the street. Mm. There's a feeling there that I think I've always been trying to kind of recapture that feeling. And that's film. And I think for photography, it's Tobin's photos, you know. Okay, okay. And I think, you know, once I started shooting pictures a lot and looking at my pictures and then looking at Tobin's old pictures that I would look at in magazines as a kid, I realized like, wow, I think I've always been trying to kind of recapture that feeling that Tobin's photos gave me. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Like Julian Stranger eating the orange next to the no trespassing sign. Like there's portraits of skateboarders where you see them totally outside of their environment. And you see this side of them or them in this situation that's so unique and special, but captured in a way that has like a lot of emotion and a, and a mood, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think Tobin's probably the most influential photographer in my life, for sure. You know, mm. in, in terms of my photography. Yeah, and in terms of uh, Dylan stories, hmm, what are some funny Dylan stories? You know, Dylan and I had like a very like big brother, little brother relationship. And he'd always be like, oh, you're like my dad or something. But we were really good friends, you know. Mm -hmm. And there was a period of time where we were together almost every day, like sort of late workshop analog gravis time. He lived like two blocks down the street and he lived in this insane apartment. So I guess one story and it's it's I can tell this story because he came out of it. You know, but when we were making Minefield, which he's, I'm sure, talked about and everyone's talked about, he was not doing well. You know, mm -hmm. he was partying too much and he was doing a lot of drugs, doing pills, and he was not skating a lot. He was skating, but not skating like he could have been skating, you know? Yeah. And I think people still love his Minefield part, but all of us who are very, knew him very well and were with him all the time knew that it was not what it could have been, you know? Yeah. And I think he more than anyone knew that it, it wasn't what it could have been, you know, and I think he felt like he let all of us down. And right. He let Hill and Carter down. So, but one story about Dylan is he came out, Arto and Dylan came out to Ohio while I was editing. A lot of people, not everyone, but some writers would come out for a couple of days, hang out. They do stuff in the back studio with Hill and Chad visuals. And then they come and sit with me and we'd work on their part and get it to where it was close to where they liked it, you know? Yep. So Arto and Dylan came out together and that's when there's like that footage of like Arto chopping the wood, right? Oh, yeah. Like that's all at like Hill's house, I think. And then there's the stuff they shot of Dylan. He's like, you know, the visual stuff of his face, you know, whatever that's in his part mm -hmm. and the prism. So they were out there for a couple of days, sat with Dylan, worked on his part. He did all those, all that stuff with them. Maybe out there, there for like one night, like a day and a night and the next day and they left or something. But it was like a couple of years later, I was hanging out with Dylan and we were talking about that period of time. And I was talking to him about when he came out to Ohio and he kind of looked at me. He was like, what are you talking about? I was like, remember when you came out to work on your part? You came out? And he's like, I don't even remember that. Oh, damn. That's how bad he was at that time. Shit, wow. He had blacked out uh, pretty much th that whole Just time period? pills or whatever. I don't know. But uh, that's a really insane story about Dylan. But I think I can tell it because it's... It says a lot about him that he came back from that. That's how kind of far down he had gone. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's what made him kind of come back and want to kind of like be the best person he could be because he had let everyone down and gone. Yeah, but yeah he failed. He, uh, yeah, I understand. Yeah, mm -hmm. but yeah, he didn't even remember coming out. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> I told him about it. He had no, he had no memory of it. So. Damn, the whole two days disappeared from his memory. Wow. Yeah, a day and a half or whatever it was. I think they were maybe out there for a night or something, but yeah. Okay, I have just a few last ones. Cool. This one is from Jamie Owens. Awesome. He said, what are some of your favorite iconic tricks you either got to film or just be on the session during? I'm sure there are lots to try and remember, but whatever the first ones that come to mind. Okay. The first ones that come to mind are Danny Way's high air and mega ramp stuff for the DC video. Yep. He 360'd the gap and I was like in a helicopter that day and that was just, maybe I was in a helicopter the whole time. I can't remember, but that, that was something I'll never forget. That was like surreal, superhuman. That ramp alone was something that just at the time seemed unreal. And then seeing him go that high and do that under that much pressure was, yeah. I'll never forget that. Mm -hmm. And then um, second thing probably is the first day I ever met Heath Kirchart. 
Oh yeah? We met him in an in and out near UCI, and then we went to this rail he wanted to try to lip slide, and it's mm -hmm. the lip slide he does in the credits of Sight Unseen. Okay. Which is like a 22 stair. It's not a rail, it's the banister on top of the rail. Like, <laughs> like I was so freaked out when I saw this thing, because it was like, I had never, I've still never seen anyone do anything that big in person, you know? Mm -hmm. It's neck high to get onto. He had to go so fast to get out to where he could get on it at a reasonable height, you know? And it was a sheer death drop on the other side. And uh, he just like packed into the ground, I don't know, maybe like six or seven times, right? And then just couldn't do it. Like his body wouldn't function anymore. I think he hurt himself or something to where he knew he couldn't do it. Okay. You know, but I'll, I'll never forget that because I mean, I skated with Heath a lot in the years later and mm -hmm. I still never saw him do anything, try anything quite like that, you know? And that was literally like, I saw him try that within the first hour I had ever met him. So I'll definitely never forget that because it was just that again, almost like the Danny thing was just like- So gnarly. Surreal yeah. and almost kind of scary, you know? Mm, like I'd, yeah, I'd, yeah, nev I'd sure. never shot anything like that before where I was like literally like so scared that he was gonna not survive, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, those are, those are the memories. The first two that come to mind. Okay, this next one is from Jacob Harris. I mentioned him earlier. Mm -hmm. So he said, what is your relationship with your old work? Stuff that a lot of people tend to regard as classic. Do you ever watch any of it these days? And if so, how does it tend to make you feel? <laughs> that is such a good question. <laughs> uh, I never watch it. I think I read somewhere you had said that, that you don't watch your videos after you, you've completed them. No, I think maybe I might have watched Minefield after maybe once. I definitely have never sat through an entire video and watched it, you know? Yeah, I just can't do it, you know? It's like, I always compare it to like, it's like looking through a photo album of a marriage that you're no longer a part of or, yeah. a part of or something. Yeah, it's like there's just every okay. single, like there's so many moments that have so much emotional effect on you. And then there's also like parts that you're not happy with or little edits that you're not happy with or whole segments maybe where who knows, I just don't enjoy it. So I don't do it, you know? Like, I think I might've actually watched through All Right, Okay mm -hmm. once or twice, not too long ago, but that's kind of different, you know? It's a shorter project. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But generally, and I could maybe, I don't know, maybe I even watched through the Dylan project too, but as far as like most stuff I've ever made, I basically finish it and I never watch it. Never watch it again. And even sitting through a premiere is like torture, you know? And some, oh, yeah? some, video, okay. some videos you have to go to a premiere tour, which is like, <laughs> for me, the most torturous. Yeah. You know, sometimes I'll like, I can do the premiere, but then if you do a premiere tour, I might just not be in there during the premiere part. And it's, it's not because I'm not proud of the videos and, you know, it's just for whatever reason, it's just hard for me, you know, to kind of sit through a video that I spent that much time on. And there's another part of me that just wants to move on and do the next thing and not like dwell on what you had done in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought it was a very interesting question, especially coming from him, because he's definitely done a lot of amazing videos. And uh, I'm sure he gets that too. Like people talk to him about like his early work and everything. And uh, obviously people talk to him about Atlantic Drift, but uh, probably his 11th hour and I.O. Vase and all that stuff must come up all the time. Yeah. I've read interviews or seen interviews or whatever of other filmmakers, not skating, but they've said similar stuff, you know. It's like, About their films? Yeah. Yeah, it's like hard. It's hard to sit through it. You know? yeah, not yeah, everyone. Yeah. Not everyone. I'm sure some people can sit there and they love watching their videos. And that's it awesome. Pro probably too. stirs too much emotion to handle, kind of, I guess, or something like that. Maybe it just depends on what type of person you are. Like, I think, I think someone could probably watch a video they made and be like, man, that was so much fun. And this is such good memories. And, mm. and that's awesome. You know? Yeah. I, maybe I'm just too <laughs> sensitive or something. I don't know. <laughs> maybe. Like, yeah. I, if I watch through a video, it's like, I think about those friendships and those relationships and the drama that happened on this one day or this shot that I fucked up or, you know an edit I don't like or a song that didn't come through or something. I don't know. I think about, not that I think about all the bad stuff, but it's just, there's so much that goes into every single shot sometimes. And, mm. and then the editing, it's like, it's just hard to relive that, you know?
This next one is from Michael Burnett. And of course, as usual, he sent me like eight questions for you. Okay. Uh, but they're all kind of short, so I can read them to you and you can pick uh, okay. whichever you want to answer. So the first one is, who's the greatest Michigan skater of all time, aside from Kalis? Aside from Kalis? Well, he said not, not Kalis. I oh, transformed it into Okay. Aside. I mean, I would say, I mean, Kalis is the first person who comes to my mind. Yeah. But aside from Kalis, I would probably say uh, Bill Danforth. Okay, build on for, okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is missing right now from skateboarding filmmaking? Um, I don't know. Nothing. There's too much of it. I can't, <laughs> I can't like sure. I can't watch all of it to even answer that question. <laughs> That's very true. Okay. If money was no object, what skate related video project would be high on the list? I mean, it's a project I want to do and I'm not going to talk about it cuz I'm going to Okay. It. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this one is random. Do people ever really change? I believe they do. What's the closest you've come to death and how did it affect your life? Um, the closest I ever came to death knowingly is when I was on a deluxe tour in 1994 and Sean Mandoli fell asleep at the wheel and our van flipped oh, going wow. like 75 miles an hour down the highway. We flipped like three or four times. Uh, nobody died. Sean, we thought he might die, but he didn't die. He was okay. And how it affected me, I actually called my dad from that motel room out in the middle of nowhere in North Carolina and told him I didn't want to go to school anymore. Why are you so resistant to calling the Nolly Nose Slide the Hunt Slide? Because <laughs> <laughs> I didn't invent it. Henry Sanchez invented everything back then, you know, yeah, or, or, Mike Car or Mike Carroll or some random tricks, you know, Sam Smythe or everyone had their own sort of tricks they could do that they invented. But I feel like I might have seen Henry do a nollie no slide or try a nollie no slide or something. I definitely didn't like invent it out of thin air. At least I like to think that I don't, you know. You drew inspiration from uh, what you were seeing at EMB and yeah. stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Describe the moment when you were the most profoundly annoyed. <laughs> Yeah. Um, God. I don't have a good answer to that. There's too many of them. And the last one is, describe an early interaction with a star of pro skating, good, bad, or other, that has stuck with you and you continue to learn from. <laughs> <Shit>. <laughs> um, I'll tell you right now. I'll tell you right now. When I drove to San Francisco with Sean Sheffy. Right, yep. I mean, I was 16 years old. I was just the most, like, grom, nerdy, skate rat kid, you know? Mm -hmm. And then my friend Goose was with us, and he was maybe, like, 19. But, you know, we were just sort of, like, skater kids from Michigan. And Goose, or, and uh, Sheffy drove with us out to SF, you know? Mm -hmm. Which just seems so surreal that he would be so down to do that. He didn't even know us at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I remember when we were driving into California, the border, it was like morning. Uh, we were driving in first, it was my first time ever in California. And I was driving and Sean was in shotgun. And keep in mind, this is like Sheffy. This is like SMA shut Sheffy when he had the big hair. You oh, yeah. Know? Mm -hmm. He was like, hey, you guys, I just want to let you know that if anything happens, if we can't stay somewhere or if there's any drama, I'm with you guys. I'll sleep in the car with you guys. Like, I'm down for you guys. So just so you know, like, while we're on this trip, I've got your back. Oh, that wow. always stuck with me, you know, that Sean seemingly such a, like, tough dude and such yeah. a, like, superstar skater at the time who was, like, really, like, everyone knew Sheffy was going to be something really special, that he would be that, like, just down to earth and sweet and humble, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay, two last ones. This one is from Tommy Guerrero. Oh, awesome. Ask him what his nickname was and why. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Does he know? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully we're talking about the same nickname. He might know. My nickname in Michigan, and he might know this because when I came out to San Francisco, I think that's what everyone was calling me, which is so random, but it was Clack. Clack, and okay. That's, everyone called me Clack. And uh, that's because we had a good friend, this kid, Bonzo, who is a deaf vert skater. Okay. He didn't skate street at all, but we would hang out and we'd go to contests around Michigan and we'd always be with Bonds. And he's a super funny kid. And I guess when he would yell out my name, Greg, because he's deaf, it would sound like clack, you know? <laughs> okay. So everyone started calling me clack. So 
I forgot about this, but I'm sure when I came out to San Francisco, if this is what Tommy's talking about, I was Goose's friend, Clack. So Sean Sheffy was with two guys named Goose and Quack, and Quack. which is so <laughs> fucked up. But what's really funny, then when I like went back to Michigan, once I like got sponsored and I started going back to Michigan on tour in like 94, 95, 96, mm-hmm. I'd meet people sometimes that would be like, hey, whatever happened to that guy Clack? <laughs> They'd ask me that. <laughs> Did they even recognize you? Like uh... They didn't know that it was me. Oh, and they'd okay, be like, okay. hey, whatever happened to that guy, Clack, Goose's buddy? And I'd be like, I don't know. I don't know whatever happened. No to idea. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, hopefully he's doing okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. It didn't stick though. Like, yeah. No, no thank God it didn't stick. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm sure I've had other nicknames that maybe I didn't know. Oh, yeah. At Embarcadero, I'm sure this is what, at Embarcadero, I was, Kelch called me Sloth Man. Sloth man? Sloth? Like, yeah, a, sloth. like a, the animal? Sloth, yeah. Kelch okay. really had my back. Like, James Kelch, I owe him so much. Like, had my back. You know, I was definitely not the coolest kid. I was super obscure. I think when I showed up, just some kid from Michigan, how I dressed, how I skated. Mm-hmm. For whatever reason, Kelch really had my back. He's who helped get me on Reel, you know? But yeah, I think he, everyone had an, everyone had a nickname there. You, you could not skate there every day, be a local. I wasn't necessarily a local, but I kind of was. I was there all, all the time. Luckily, because of Kelch, I was able to skate there every day. But yeah, my nickname was Sloth or Sloth Man. Sloth Man. <laughs> Sloth you know, man. and that's like just a Kelch thing. Everyone had a fucked up nickname. So it's not really embarrassing. I guess it's because I look like a sloth, I guess. You know? <laughs> so yeah, that was my other nickname. But I think Tommy's probably talking about Clack. Okay, very final one. This one is from Farron Golding. Oh, awesome. So he said, in recent years, physical copies have become a much smaller aspect of skateboarding media, especially when it comes to skate videos. Looking back, you had photo books accompany three of your biggest video projects, the DC video, Minefield, and Propeller. Whereas a couple of years ago, a print project somewhat stood in for physical copy of a video when you made All Right OK in an accompanying photo book for Vans. Firstly, why do you think that print projects which are tied to skate videos have become a somewhat common substitute for a physical copy of a skate video? Supreme made a book of video stills rather than a DVD of Play Dead, or Quasi Mm. made an actual literary book for simulation, (laughs) the latest one. Yeah. And he said, secondly, whilst physical skate media in general is more of a niche interest now, why do you think print has fared better in terms of longevity than physical videos? considering both mediums have been affected by how the internet made skate media so frequently accessible. Okay. Um, Okay, I feel like physical copies of skate videos are still, like, really, like, cherished if you can find them, right? Yeah. People don't make them. I mean, you can't really... You can make small batches of VHS now, but I don't even think you can make big batches of VHS because I don't think there's that much tape left. That's what I heard. Mm Mm-hmm. And then DVDs, it's just kind of a nightmare to make a DVD. I mean, I know people still do it at times, but but I feel like the skate videos, I'm surprised that there's people that hit me up all the time looking for copies of old skate videos, people that collect VHS videos, collect DVDs, mm. you know, so like the secret tape guy or you know. yeah, yeah, I mean, I think so. I think there is still a lot of interest in physical copies. I think it's just it's too difficult to actually make them. So no one's really making them anymore for a lot of different reasons. But I think print, you know, um, in terms of like books and stuff, I think it's just a different type of experience, you know, Mm -hmm. looking at a picture and turning a page. It's tactile, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's not on a computer screen or a TV screen. It's something in your hand, you know. You can control the pace of how you flow through it. It has a different kind of emotional effect on you, you know, when you're looking at it versus a video. It's a totally different thing, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, um... It's funny because like with the first DC video booklet, you know, at the time my thought was like, these DVD cases suck, you know, they're plastic, they're all the same. The little pieces that hold the DVD in always break, you Mm, know, like the DVDs scratch and get fucked up. I was like, none of it ever seemed like it was going to last, you know, plus the DVDs, technically DVDs only last 10 or 15 years before they stop playing, you know, that data doesn't, really? it's not, oh. it's, yeah, it's not archival. I mean, maybe I'm sure okay. they can go longer, but same with VHS, all that, nothing, none of that stuff lasts long, uh-huh. you know? So my thought was, um, 
you know, let's make something that's like these DVD cases are like someday just going to be in some just box or yeah, yeah. old drawer versus like, let's make something that like goes on a bookshelf, but that's a DVD, same size as a DVD case, you know? So that way, like you can have it up there with your DVDs, but then years down the road when you don't have DVDs anymore, you can still have this awesome little book. So that was yeah, sort of yeah, like yeah, yeah. where that idea came from. Okay. And, um, I'm stoked. I'm like really stoked. I don't see the DC video DVD book that much these days. Every once in a while, someone will bring one around and I'll see it. Mm -hmm. But it's surprising because they made a lot of those, you know. But the minefield, I see a lot, you know, like if I'm mm. doing like a book signing or something like that, like a lot of people will bring that minefield book, you know, mm. and it's just, I don't know, there's like a permanence, nothing's permanent, obviously, but there's a permanence to print that, especially nowadays, video just doesn't have, you know, and I think people really appreciate that, you know, people like, obviously now you can, there's people like VHS tapes, people are into collecting vinyl. Yeah, yeah. People are into like keeping stuff. I think that's especially a lot of younger, I say younger, but younger people that grew up in the digital age where everything was fucking digital, you know, yeah, like yeah. all the photos of them as kids are on a digital camera or a phone, you know, like all the videos are on a phone or a little digital camera. It's like really awesome to see a physical book or a physical print or mm. have an actual album with a cover and has like you can touch it and smell it and stuff. So. I think it comes from that. I think just humans appreciate physical objects. And if there's something that they really like, a film or a photographer or a person or whatever, a piece of music, it's nice to have a physical version of that. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, well, let's wrap it up here. Thank you so much, Greg. Thank of you. I was, uh, of course, expecting to be blown away, but not that much. So, yeah, thank <laughs> you. This was amazing. Of course. It was uh, awesome to chat with you. That's it for my conversation with Greg. Follow him on Instagram at HunFilmWork and go visit his website HunFilmWork.com. Do yourself a favor and go watch and re-watch all of the amazing skate videos he's been a part of in the last 30 years. A visual sound and tink and folklore for serious skateboards, anthology, sight unseen and video radio for Transworld, the DC video and its deluxe edition for DC Shoes, Kalis and Mono and Minefield for Alien Workshop, the Dylan solo part for Gravis Footwear, Propeller, Nice to See You, and All Right OK for Vance Shoes. Make sure to also check out his music videos for Cat Power, as well as his amazing photography books. Thank you for tuning in. See you soon for a new episode of Beyond the Moon.